got everyone in the room here in Canberra, so we might kick off. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. I declare open this hearing of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19. Today's public hearing will focus on vaccinations, but may cover other matters under the terms of reference. Information on the procedural rules governing public hearings has been provided to all witnesses and is available from the Secretariat. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should explain the basis for the objection in sufficient detail to allow the committee to determine whether to accept the objection. The committee will then decide whether to insist on an answer. Witnesses may request that answers be given confidentially. I remind those on video conference to mute your microphone when you're not speaking, and witnesses appearing via teleconference should state their name each time they speak. Uh, if everyone could please ensure that mobile phones are switched off or turned to silent. The committee has scheduled a short 15 minute break at midday. Uh, for those on the video conference, uh, we have representatives from the Department of Health, the National COVID Vaccine Task Force, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and uh, I can see representatives of ATAGI on video conference as well. Uh, is anyone wanting to make an opening statement or table any documents? Right, so we have. Se Senator, Thank um, you. Lieutenant General Fruin will make an opening statement as the, as the main topic is on vaccines today. Okay. General, would you like to proceed? Sure, I'll just you. check in with ATAGI whether ATAGI or the TGA would like to make an opening statement. No, Professor Skerritt, no. Dr Cheng or Ms. Uh, Dr Blythe, no? Okay. All right. The, the floor is yours, General. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the vaccine rollout to this committee. Uh, as you are aware, I was appointed on the 8th of June uh, this year as Coordinator General of the National COVID Vaccine Task Force, which was week 16 of the vaccine rollout. As I stated during my appearance before this committee at that time, I have been appointed as we enter a new phase of the rollout and to build on the progress in the rollout to date. In week 16, when I arrived, 5.2 million doses have been administered. administered. Now in week 22, over 10.6 million doses have been administered. Since my appointment, I have undertaken an operational review of the vaccine program and developed a campaign plan that I'm taking to National Cabinet today. In the plan, I have identified three key areas to focus on, improving coordination and efficiency of the plan, building public confidence and motivating people to get vaccinated, and a safe and efficient rollout of the vaccination plan. This plan has been developed in consultation with the states and territories, health and community sector organisations, business, industry, unions, and other stakeholders. I intend to publicly release this plan after it has been through National Cabinet. I have had a particular focus on aged care. Uh, all residential aged care facilities have had both their first and second dose visit. I have also deployed roving clinics in New South Wales and Victoria to vaccinate residents and workers in consultation with their health authorities. Overall program progress to date has seen three quarters of over 70s receiving a first dose of COVID-19 vaccine and a third are now fully vaccinated. More than half of the over 50s have received at least a first dose and more than a third of the eligible population aged 16 years and above have now received at least a first dose. Since I last appeared at this committee, I have fast tracked the transition of general practice to administer Pfizer. This acceleration has seen around 1,250 practices administering Pfizer across Australia, including over 400 in New South Wales. I am boosting the program by accelerating community pharmacies to administer vaccines. I am immediately onboarding 64 pharmacies to address the current outbreak in New South Wales, and these pharmacies will be administering AstraZeneca from next week. This means from next week I will have 251 pharmacies operating and delivering COVID vaccines, 64 in New South Wales alone. I continue to look for opportunities to fast track this program and ensure vaccine coverage across the nation. I am committed to administering the rollout with transparency, and I have released data by state and territory and additional age breakdowns and I will be releasing more data, including on the aged care and disability sectors shortly. From now until the end of August, I anticipate receiving around 1 million doses of Pfizer per week. In conjunction with the additional points of vaccination and the willingness of the public to turn up for their jabs, I look forward to building further momentum in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Chair. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Could we please have a copy of that? Because I think there are questions that arise from that statement that sure. I would like to ask. Is that able to be emailed? Like I have questions uh, now, have but I would a like a copy to work from. We'll get that. Thank sure. you. I can give you this one. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear. Could I just start 
I'll come back to your statement, but um, in terms of aged care workers and disability um, residents and disability workers, do you have any updates for me on the numbers that are, have been vaccinated? Sure. Is that workers and residents? Or just yes, workers I'd care? like workers and residents. Yeah, so in aged care, uh, we currently have in residents 86.3% first dose and 82.3% fully vaccinated. In aged care workers, we have 47.2% first dose and 27.8% fully vaccinated. Uh, in disability residents... Sorry, could you say that one again? Sure. Aged care workers, first dose, 47.2%. Uh, fully vaccinated, 27.8%. In disability residents, we have 57.7% first dose and 34.7% fully vaccinated. And in disability workers, we have 50.9% first dose and 27.3% fully vaccinated. And that, that's up till what would be that, that Yesterday. Day? Yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Has that been published? Is that published in your updates on your vaccine uh, numbers? Is that breakdown or is that...? Uh, there is in the daily update slides. Uh, I'll just check exactly what's okay. in there. I guess the question that comes out of that is they are all classified as 1A under the National Immunisation or Vaccination Plan. I mean, why is it that 16 weeks after we were meant to have these populations vaccinated, we're still at such low levels, particularly for the workforce? I mean, to have a third of the workforce vaccinated 16 weeks after the government's own deadline to get them done under 1A. I mean, what has gone wrong? So uh, earlier in the program, Chair, the uh, focus was put onto aged care residents who were considered the most vulnerable. And uh, my understanding is decisions were made at the time to prioritise uh, the residents over the workers because they were not only the most vulnerable, but there was a concern about potential uh, adverse effects of vaccination on workers at the same time. And they, they didn't want to uh, have uh, workers um, unable to uh, service the residents at that time. So since then, we have been now focusing very specifically on the aged care workers. Uh, you've heard that every aged care facility has had a first dose and second dose visit now, and we have been running uh, clinics back through to do uh, you know, top-up vaccinations, if you like. Uh, and now we are also doing workers as a priority, uh, and the numbers on workers have been coming up. But now when uh, the workers do visit, uh, our, our vaccinators visit the uh, facilities, they will do workers and uh, residents at the same time. Okay. So when you say decisions were taken, was that a National Cabinet decision, decisions to prioritise residents over workers? That was a programmatic decision, Senator, that we, we made in the department, that, right. uh, and that has been clearly borne out by the fact that despite the big outbreak in New South Wales and several incursions into aged care facilities, we haven't had one aged care resident. Uh, there have been six positive and all uh, five out of the six are vaccinated and all are well and mm. we haven't seen the terrible consequences we saw in Victoria that there's no question that the major driver for vaccination was to protect those vulnerable for severe disease it's a secondary effect to prevent transmission we know we've seen in Sydney that fully vaccinated people can transmit so it was a decision on two grounds one is that the Aged care residents in the Victoria, in the Australian context, were the single most likely to get severe disease and unfortunately die, as they, we saw in Victoria. And the other advice was from the US, where they tried to do workers and residents at the same time, and doing mass vaccination of workers in one hit led to lots of absenteeism and significant challenges. So the decision at the time, and also as we've discussed at this committee on many occasions, the complexity of doing aged care residents was very significantly greater than the vaccination providers initially thought. So there was a programmatic decision that we had to get aged care residents protected before winter. And we stand by that as an absolute priority. Now at the same time, we've been doing workers the whole way through, but the, the intense focus on the workers has happened now, as Lieutenant General Fruin has indicated. But they were all, I mean, I guess 
My point is they were all 1A. They were all 1A. They, they, they were all They were one. all meant to be done in that six week time well, that frame was the which original, you set that yourself. Was the, that was the original aim, Senator, but there are people in 1A uh, all that who will be who are continually being vaccinated. There are yeah, quarantine I'm and border sorry. workers who are being done at the same time. So yeah. that was a programmatic decision that we think pro provided the best protection for the most vulnerable. So you think the decision where you you made that was the right one? Absolutely, protecting the aged so care. So it wasn't. It was really your, an admission that you could have only ever done one. You could only do residents. Well, no, we could, it was the the two reasons were that we needed to get residents completely done before winter. Uh, we would need to give an intense focus on the resident. But the other reason that we, uh, Lieutenant General Fruin and I have already said, is that the evidence that came from other countries uh, was that trying to do all of the workers and the residents at the same time was causing significant disruption to facilities as many of the staff were absent um, after the vaccination and it was seen to be better to do it uh, in a more uh, compartmentalised way. So that was the decision taken at the time and we have protected the residents and we are very proud to have done that. General Fruin, your um, opening statement, you said you've focused on three key areas, improving coordination and efficiency, building public confidence, motivating people to get vaccinated and a safe and efficient rollout of the vaccination plan. I mean, why are you having to do that sort of 16 more weeks in? Like, why wasn't this done at the beginning of the program? Uh, those things have been done up until now, Chair. I'm building on the work that has been done previously. Uh, this is a next phase of the vaccine rollout. Um, I've indicated that when I came on board, 5.2 million doses of vaccines uh, had been delivered in 16 weeks. Uh, now uh, I'm at a point where we are about to have uh, greater amounts of vaccine coming in. We're about to open up many more distribution points. Uh, so the plan that I've developed is from here until uh, the end of the vaccine program. But I mean, reading your opening statement, I mean, implicit in what you're saying is that coordination, efficiency, public confidence, motivating vaccination and, and safe and efficiency are areas which you're concerned about. I'm saying they're the areas that I wish to focus on, having now taken control of the program. Uh, I'm not commenting on what was done before in those areas. I think all of those things have been done previously. But there's improvements in all of those, presumably. I mean, if you're focusing on it, you've reviewed it, these are your key focus areas. Yeah. They're areas where you've identified deficiencies and you need to make improvements. I, I think there's areas where we can make enhancements. There'll be more enhancements in some of those areas than others. But, uh, of course, I'm here to accelerate, so I'll be looking at every option okay. to accelerate. Well, perhaps if I, t what are the big problems that you've identified in your review? What are so the, the um So the review of the plan uh, has led to this campaign plan. We've now worked, I've run uh, activities with the states and territories, with the health sector uh, and others to, to refine the plan. The plan is an umbrella uh, construct that will allow the states and territories now to work uh, even more closely with us in partnership to achieve the rollout in their jurisdictions. Areas that I'm focusing on are that uh, I am seeking to bring more points of distribution. The, the rollout had been built on two key, uh, uh, you know, fundamental sort of supply lines, if you like. One was down the primary healthcare network, the federal GPs and federal clinics. The other was down the, the state clinics, uh, and that is what had up until my arrival, delivered uh, 5.2 million vaccines by that stage. Uh, as we go through the year, I'm now committed to bringing <coughs> as many points of distribution into play as possible. You may have seen yesterday uh, that we will now be bringing uh, pharmacists into play. Uh, we're looking at all of the options from mass vaccination clinics, pop-up clinics, uh, pharmacies, as I've mentioned, because what I seek to have now, as we have that greater supply, is a greater diversity of distribution points. And in that, we will have both greater resilience and greater flexibility. And as things, some things are working and others aren't, we'll be able to move around in between them. But ultimately by uh, the latter months of the year, I wanna have maximum convenience in vaccination so that uh, difficulty of getting vaccines is not a reason why uh, some of those people who are perhaps more hesitant or perhaps more, uh, you know, getting around to getting vaccinated, you know, that isn't an excuse. Uh, the other okay. thing that the plan does is I'm seeking to build uh, 
relationships with the states and territories that will allow us to more dynamically reallocate vaccines between the federal and the state hubs. Because uh, as we go further into the year, again, I want to identify where there are efficiencies and perhaps inefficiencies and be able to redistribute supply between those as quickly as we can. Okay. So we're developing an assessment cell and we're developing uh, specific relationships with each of the jurisdictions to achieve this. The other probably key thing in the plan is uh, I'm developing a national response option uh, in military parlance, a commander's reserve of a workforce. And in time when we have uh, adequate supplies, uh, vaccines as well, where we will be able to uh, respond with a, uh, a federal capability to assist states and jurisdictions to, um, to, to resolve either a, uh, you know, a, a problem resulting from, say, an outbreak like we're seeing at the moment in New South Wales, or if a jurisdiction is just falling behind or there is a particular uh, locality that we've had a bit of an issue with that, that I've got an asset that I can send to help sure. those states and territories. Quickly. So how much then has lack of supply led to problems with the rollout of the vaccine in your, after your review? I think uh, the, the vaccine rollout nationally has been built around the two vaccines, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Uh, the, we've always known the Pfizer was due to come later through the year. I think with AstraZeneca there were uh, some challenges clearly around some of the uh, the guidance that was given around Pfizer, that did cause some slowdowns. Uh, but the, the program has been rolling on uh, as well as it can with the supply we've got. Now as we're getting to that period where we can get more okay. supply, we will accelerate. But that wasn't my question. My question was how much has lack of supply led to problems with the rollout? Uh, I think the rollout has been working with the supply available, which is what you do with any rollout. So did supply shortages come up as part of your review? like shortage of vaccine supply? Having to prioritise between available vaccines is certainly a consideration, but so like any logistic problem, you deal with what you have available. So. Yeah, and you didn't have enough. Well, when do you ever have enough? Hey? When do you ever have enough? We, uh, we, we are dealing with what we can get off global supply chains. Uh, you know, this is a global pandemic with global demand for these vaccines. Vaccines have been procured. Vaccines are procured as they are produced. So we are dealing with vaccines. Yeah, but as they we only come had off two vaccines, chains. didn't we, that were available to us? We have two uh, currently. Of the number of yeah. deals we had. Yeah, there's two vaccines available now, and there's a third one that's scheduled to come on later in the year. Okay. And we had plenty of AstraZeneca for full population coverage. It was the unfortunate occurrence of the thrombotic uh, syndrome and the ATAGI advice that limited the availability of AstraZeneca to the over 60s, yeah. that was the only factor that has made us supply constrained with Pfizer. We had plentiful supplies. We currently have plentiful supplies of AstraZeneca. That was a very unexpected event, uh, the TTS, and I think the General has pivoted very strongly around that, and we have managed to work with Pfizer to get increasing doses, and we're now delivering a million doses of Pfizer a week, and AstraZeneca is still holding up. I know, but we had no redundancy when, when had, those problems we had, were identified. We had other you redundancy. didn't have any, any we other had, to fall back on. Novavax, we have ordered. Now, that was meant to come uh, in quarter two this year. They have had production delays, but they are coming in quarter three. And we have Moderna uh, coming in quarter three. Yeah. And we also have access to the COVAX facility that has already supplied us some Pfizer and can supply us more. So we had a diverse, redundant uh, uh, supply, but with a strong focus on local production. Yeah, but we didn't. At the time we needed it, we didn't have it. We didn't have enough Pfizer. When those decisions were made around AstraZeneca, we didn't have enough to compensate for that change in advice. That's we, correct, we, isn't we, it? Because we, we have, didn't have we enough. Have more, we, have full, the, we have full population coverage of Pfizer, and we increased our Pfizer orders when those events occurred. And clearly in a global supply chain, like most other countries that don't produce a vaccine locally, we're dependent on those, those deliveries. So we have more than enough Pfizer coming. It's, it is just coming progressively Late. during the year. Yeah. But when you ordered your first 10 million Pfizer and you, relied on, you were relying on AstraZeneca, what was the risk management? We were, oh, at the time, if I could just finish, sorry, yeah, Professor yeah, Murphy, yeah. of um, you know what was the risk management exercise that we'd done, saying that AstraZeneca fell over, or you, there mm -hmm. was some issue there. 
when that happened, there wasn't enough Pfizer and you had to go and make other arrangements with Pfizer. So, Senator, at the time we made the... And remember that our, all of our vaccine purchases were on the advice of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. At the time, we ordered the 10 million strategic investment in Pfizer. We had double population coverage of two locally produced vaccines that were planned, the University of Queensland vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. It has been obviously very unfortunate that the University of Queensland vaccine, which is an excellent vaccine, had an issue with the <coughs> HIV. And as soon as that one was discontinued, we increased our Pfizer order. And then as soon as the uh, AstraZeneca clotting issue occurred, we further increased our Pfizer order. But those decisions were made on the best expert medical advice at the time, and government has st stuck with the advice that CITAG has provided. It was very unfortunate that having local production of vaccines was, has been the reason those countries that have done really well in vaccination, such as the UK and the US, have had local production of vaccines as their mainstay. That is the only way of getting really good early access. And uh, we have adjusted our program according to the events that have happened over the time. But I repeat, our decisions were made on the best expert advice. Okay, and you, you don't think in hindsight... Sorry? It, oh, sorry. Um, just, I just want to understand, because I've heard the line of questioning several times about that we didn't have a redundancy plan that it, it, on the back of your line of questioning. I just want to understand what vaccinations are available and being used in the world today so that we can... Yeah, well, we could probably come to that when you get the call, Senator Davey. That would be more appropriate. But in terms of um, your, where you sit now, you think all of those decisions were the right ones to make? At the, at the time, they were the decisions that were made by our expert panel, and I think they were appropriate for the circumstances at the time. Remembering also that at the time when we made the strategic investment in Pfizer, none of the vaccines had uh, proven uh, phase three clinical trial data and no mRNA vaccine had ever been used in humans. So our scientific and technical advisory group had a strong preference for protein subunit vaccines, which is yeah. why we, we did University of Queensland and Novavax, double 50,000 plus of each, and then a strategic purchase with local production of an adenovirus vaccine at AstraZeneca, which was the next most proven technology, and a strategic investment in the as yet unproven Pfizer on the dose amount that they offered us, the 10 million that they offered us, and, but with an option to increase should it be successful and should we have issues with other vaccines. And all of those options have been exercised. Yeah, but here we are today, 13 and a half million people in lockdown, you know, the major states in lockdown. Um, we've got low levels, the lowest in the OECD in terms of our population vaccinated. Well, we, and we shortage have, of supply has contributed to that. We have, we have, so it has to go back to the original deal and the original advice to government or the decisions the government took? The, the original advice to government was all accepted by government. Professor Kelly yeah, can, we know talk, that. can talk to you about the Delta strain, uh, which is uh, growing in countries even with much higher vaccination rates than ours. The Delta strain is a very different uh, issue, but Professor Kelly can give you a description on that. So I'm not well, I'm sure, sure that we, you can I'm say sure that our lockdowns are necessarily related to the vaccination rate. What we can say really? is is that the protection of the elderly and the vulnerable has been achieved, and that is the most important goal of the vaccination. Every state and territory leader I have heard has said that the low vaccination rate is linked to the lockdowns and that lockdowns will continue while we have low levels of vaccination. And you're saying that's not correct? I'm saying that uh, the Delta outbreak uh, has a, a Delta outbreaks have occurred in the UK and they're occurring in the US, they're occurring in Israel and uh, uh, Singapore has, re has a higher vaccination rate and have locked down because of their Delta outbreak. It's, it's a complex picture. Certainly vaccination, high vaccination is a factor uh, in transmission, but I don't think you can 
uh, directly attribute the lockdowns uh, to, to our vaccination rate. If we had been where we planned to be, which is you know, two months, we're about two months behind our original plan because of the issues with AstraZeneca and international supply, it may well be that uh, many of those states would have locked down anyway. But Professor Kelly can, can, can address that issue. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Murphy, uh, Professor Paul Kelly, Chief Medical Officer. So uh, as, as uh, Dr Murphy's been saying, um, uh, the vaccine rollout in the UK, for example, is extremely high. Uh, they are currently um, having more than 40,000 cases a day. Um, they like uh, they they have are not seeing the the very severe end of the spectrum to a great extent, but there are deaths, there are ICU admissions, uh, and uh, many other countries in around the world are starting to put in other other measures, the the standard public health measures that we've we've seen before, um, at, at which they had before the vaccine rollout. The reason is, and this is what we've learnt all the way through this pandemic, is that things change. The the major constraint at the moment is the is the variant, the, the Delta variant. It is much more transmissible. Even in Sydney right now, with a very severe not lockdown, um, the, the R effective, which is our number that we look at about how, how transmissible the vaccine is, uh, sorry, the variant, uh, the virus is uh, in the um, population, uh, is still over one. That means it is still likely to grow. Uh, and we need to think through all of the things we can do. They've put in very severe lockdowns. Uh, we're in, in very strong discussions with New South Wales at the moment about what we can do to assist further. And uh, one of those issues is the one that, um, that uh, Lieutenant General uh, Fruin has already mentioned around the, the, vac the vaccine rollout and expanding that vaccine rollout in, um, in pharmacies. So, uh, this is the time to be nimble as it has always been right through the last 18 months to think, uh, to see what the data shows us, what is actually happening on the ground and deal with those difficult, uh, difficult moments. Sure. But we're not alone in that. Uh, and the vaccine is part of the issue, part of the solution, but it's not the only part of the solution. Okay. But I think Professor Murphy said that um, all the vulnerable populations have been protected. They as, have. Well, yeah. what, you, we've got one third of over 70s fully vaccinated. We've got, we, we have we've a got very low levels in disability residential care. We've got low levels amongst the workers that work there. And now you're saying that the lockdowns aren't related to the low levels of vaccination when I've heard every state and territory leader say they are directly linked to that fact and directly linked to the fact that vulnerable populations have not got the level of vaccination that they need for state premiers to feel comfortable at, at not having these hard lockdowns occur. So, and you see, disagree with that, or so Professor Murphy does? Can I uh, please um, use the data that we have in front of us? So I've compared the, uh, the epidemiology of the current outbreak in Sydney uh, with the one in Victoria last year, pre-vaccine. Uh, and Professor Murphy's already mentioned this, uh, the, the, the terrible scenes we saw in aged care last year in terms of residents dying, uh, many residents being, thousands of residents being in, infected, uh, and many of those going needing to go to hospital. Terrible scenes, we don't, don't want that repeated. What we have achieved, and this is a major achievement that I, I think, Senator, you should, should also think about. Uh, we, have, we have gone twice to every single aged care residents in the country. Yeah. We have we have offered uh, offered vaccine, and the vast majority of residents have taken that up. As was we, committed not, to in one A of the plan to be yes, done within and, six and weeks. The, and the result is that we have, whilst we have the the the, uh, the issues in Sydney right now, particularly affecting younger people, uh, as we did in in Victoria last year in terms of cases, it's mostly in that 20 to 40 age group. Um, we're not seeing cases in the, in the older people. Why? Because that vaccine rollout of over 75% of first doses in, that, in the over 70s uh, is having an effect, and particularly the effect of the, of the vaccine in the aged care residents. We are not seeing, and we, we have seen, both in New South Wales and in Victoria last month, a large number of aged care facilities that have been linked with the outbreak, either, either um, uh, uh, primary close contacts in, in staff or visitors. Uh, we've seen the occasional resident uh, become infected. Uh, but so far, um, none of them have been seriously mm. ill. And that, that is a major 
change from last year, and that's yeah. due to the and vaccination program. Yeah. But I, I, anyway, we will come back to this because I should hand the call um, now to Senator Davey or Senator Bragg. I don't know who's getting the call. Senator Davey. We'll come back. Yeah, thanks, um, Chair. I'll, I'll start today. Um, uh, as, as, I, as I alluded to before, and I apologise for interrupting, Chair, I, I just want to understand um, what different vaccinations are available, because we do hear all the time that um, we should have had a redundancy program. My understanding, however, is that um, at this stage, certainly in Australia, um, Pfizer and AstraZeneca are the only two approved for use with um, uh, applications proceeding for Moderna and Novavax. What other vaccinations are available and are being used around the world? So the other the other vaccines, are, uh, Professor Skerritt can perhaps uh, address it. Uh, that might be might be better. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. Uh, John Skerritt, Deputy Secretary, Health Products Regulation and Head of TGA. So, uh, in addition to the two vaccines we've talked about this morning, uh, there is a regulatory approval, but not a purchase or rollout of the Janssen vaccine. That's a single shot uh, vaccine that is uh, similar to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, Given we have plentiful supplies of AstraZeneca and the Johnson or Janssen, it's the same company, Johnson and Johnson and Janssen, uh, given that that vaccine has also been associated with the TTS throm uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, it wasn't felt necessary or appropriate to purchase additional quantities of that. It has regulatory approval because there is interest, especially in remote Pacific Island countries where getting a team in to vaccinate once is hard enough, getting the same team to come back to the same village on an island twice is almost impossible. So there, there is that attraction, particularly for remote communities of a single shot vaccine. Uh, the other vaccines that we are currently evaluating are Moderna and Novavax. Uh, uh, Dr Murphy has indicated that Novavax uh, has had some scale up manufacturing issues and therefore we still do not have the complete information on the manufacturing because with a vaccine it's not just the clinical trials, which I should add are quite promising with that vaccine, but making sure the product can be manufactured at scale and manufactured consistently. And so for that reason Novavax has not been approved by any country globally. Uh, we do hope however, and we're onto the phone to them almost daily, and we do hope that uh, we will receive a complete set of information in September, uh, but we really are at the mercy of a company for when they've sorted out the manufacturing issues. Moderna is a vaccine that's very similar to the Pfizer vaccine, but, uh, and has regulatory approval in a number of countries. Uh, we received an application for Moderna, uh, I, I can give you the date, uh, it, it, it was only a matter of a few weeks ago, and I should put on record that while we actively talk with companies and encourage them to put an application into Australia, if, for example, they know they can't manufacture enough vaccine for the whole world, they adopt a strategy of maybe we'll just do the US first or maybe we'll just do Europe first because otherwise you create a demand that you can't uh, commit to. Uh, so, but we do have an application now from Moderna. Uh, we again are working with Moderna on a, on, a, on a few manufacturing sites, so we are still waiting for data from them. Our advisory committee for vaccines, uh, which is an external committee that looks at our evaluation work, so they assess our homework, so to speak, is meeting on the 30th of July, and providing they're happy with it and providing they're happy with Moderna's responses, we would hope that uh, there would be a regulatory approval of that product in, uh, in early, uh, August, but again, it's, uh, there's a lot of provider, provisos there. Uh, now, there are a number of, just to finish up, there are a number of other vaccines that have been approved globally, about seven or eight in jurisdictions ranging from Cuba through to China, through to India, through to Russia, as well as a few other weird and wonderful ones. Uh, we are interested in understanding about those products because later on when borders open up, it will be important to know about, for example, 
you know, whether Chinese people who may have been vaccinated with the Chinese vaccine or indeed Pacific Islanders who have been vaccinated with a particular Chinese vaccine are considered to be fully vaccinated by Australian standards. So we, and we also are working in the region with funding from the Department of Foreign Affairs. So we have more than a passing interest in the other seven or eight vaccines that have been approved. There are reports of varying efficacy of those. In fact, there's been a number of concerns expressed recently with one of the Chinese vaccines because many Indonesian healthcare workers who were fully vaccinated with vaccines sadly have passed away. You know, Indonesia currently is a global hotspot for the COVID pandemic. Um, yes, I've, I've heard about the Indonesia and my understanding is that they have been relying a lot on the um, Chinese vaccine, is that yes. correct? Uh, correct. And uh, I mean, that's obviously a decision by the Indonesians. Uh, mm. There are a number of countries. Peru has also been uh, relying on it. And indeed, Thailand has been relying on it. And some of those countries are now contemplating a third shot with an alternative vaccine, such as Pfizer or AstraZeneca, uh, to, to add to immunity. Now, I don't want to badmouth a particular product because we have not yet had access to the full uh, clinical performance data, but it does appear that some of the other vaccines used globally are not as efficacious as the two that Australian have in use. And based on the clinical data we're looking at today, as the two we're currently evaluating for Australia. So just to be clear, at the time when the ATAGI advice changed uh, regarding AstraZeneca, we didn't have any other applications in for any other um, alternatives. So when people are saying we should have had alternatives on the shelves ready to roll out, we didn't even have the applications in for. At the time of the change to the ATAGI <coughs> advice, or the couple of changes to the ATAGI advice, the only other, uh, the only, the only other product that was approved in Australia uh, was uh, Pfizer. The only other product we have had an app, a full application for and I'm, was Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, and it has some of the same issues as AstraZeneca. As I mentioned earlier, we, our applications are incomplete for both Novavax and Moderna. So it's not as if I stood up a team working 24-7 on the Moderna or Novavax applications that we could approve it tomorrow or the week after. We are waiting on data from both companies. Um, thank you very much. I just I have a couple of questions, um, probably for uh, Major General Bruin, uh, regarding the the rollout vaccination rollout. Um, we now have two hundred and fifty one pharmacies ready to go. Um, is my understanding sixty four in New South Wales? Are they mainly based in the regions or in urban centres? Uh, the pharmacies that were bought on early in the program were based in uh, regional and remote areas where there wasn't GP coverage, uh, but now we are focusing on uh, a nationwide rollout. I am bringing pharmacies on as a priority into South West Sydney right now, and we'll have uh, 48 of those starting on Monday. Uh, but then we will... Uh, we, so we've got another 118 across the nation currently, but through the end of this month, we will have more than 500 pharmacies bought on board. Uh, through August, I hope to have just shy of 900 bought on board. Um, and then by the end of September, we'll be getting up towards uh, more than 3,000 into October. Uh, we seek to have as many of the, you know, around about 4,000 pharmacies we think are, are suitable online. Um, and the delay in getting pharmacies on board, because we've heard through this committee um, since the commencement of the vaccination rollout, uh, that community pharmacies were always part of the plan. Yep. Can you um, let us know why there was a delay in actually getting getting the pharmacies on board? Where where was that delay? How so that my delay my understanding is the decision was made early to focus on uh, GPs as the initial backbone, always with a plan for pharmacies, and I think that has uh, proved to be very effective to date. Uh, more than six million of the the ten point you know, six or eight million doses that have been administered since have gone through the Commonwealth GP hubs. So I think that has been effective. Uh, but now the time is right for us to bring pharmacists into play. 
Um, and do you have a breakdown of numbers um, in regional and remote Australia? I, I know uh, we've been utilising the Royal Flying Doctors Service and uh, they, uh, according to their website, they've rolled out over 5,000 vaccinations in some of our most remote areas. Do you have um, more of a line of sight as to how much vaccinations are going out into the regional areas? Yeah, I might, uh, I'll get my colleague, Dr. Detoka, to speak to that. Uh, thanks, General. Dr. Lucas Detoka, First Assistant Secretary, Implementation and Primary Care Response, National COVID Vaccine Task Force. Um, so regional, rural and remote uh, Australia have always been our main focus of the vaccine uh, program, noting that uh, for a range of reasons, access to healthcare, um, other, other uh, address situations, it was a priority to ensure that uh, the regions had equitable access to the vaccines, even though uh, they have been uh, less impacted by COVID so far, touch wood, than other parts of the country. At the moment, we have a parity of vaccine rates between um, metro areas and outside of metro areas, um, and it's rapidly accelerated, accelerating in remote um, and very remote areas through a combination of a joint uh, state and territory, Commonwealth, primary care and Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, activity. Aboriginal community controlled health services are also playing a major role in the uh, remote aspects of the rollout. And as part of the uh, rollout of the primary care, um, and as General Fruin indicated, the uh, um, transition of primary care sites to also of Pfizer in addition to uh, AstraZeneca, we've recognised that it's important to index um, a, an extra loading on the regional, rural and remote sites through primary care to, to make sure that areas that are uh, otherwise smaller in population but less dense, so diff more, harder to reach in a, in a mass vaccination type of uh, a rollout, have early access to the vaccine. Of the current uh, primary care sites administering AstraZeneca across the country, um, 1,289 uh, in the regions, and of those, uh, 522 are already administering both AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Um, great. Okay. With, um, particularly with our Indigenous communities, and last question, sorry, Chair. Um, yeah, um, and I, I, I note the fantastic work the Aboriginal Medical Health Services have been doing in those communities. There has been reports of a quite significant vaccine hesit hesitancy, perhaps more so, amongst Indigenous communities. Um, are we starting to see that reverse, um, or are we getting good uptake in our Indigenous communities? Uh, thank you, Senator. So, as, as you know and, and, and alluded to, every aspect of the COVID-19 response and vaccine rollout has been done in partnership with the Aboriginal health sector, uh, primarily through the National Aboriginal Advisory Group on COVID-19. And the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander stakeholders have also been quite vocal on, on focusing on how to drive uptake as opposed to potentially magnify reports on hesitancy. We have seen pockets of hesitancy in some Aboriginal communities as we have seen pockets of hesitancy in non-Indigenous communities, but we, we don't think there's a generalised uh, differential uh, willingness to take vaccine uh, situation ac across communities. What we did see is that uh, a significant proportion of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population uh, were accessing vaccine preferentially through primary care, majorly through Aboriginal community controlled health services. So the fact that um, uh, the changes on the uh, uh, on the recommendations for AstraZeneca following the identification of the thrombosis, the thrombocytopenia syndrome, meant that uh, people under 50 initially and then people under 60 uh, were preferred to access um, the Pfizer vaccine. And uh, the immense majority of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population is under 60, meant that for a period, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people aren't, weren't able to access uh, the preferred vaccine for the age group that was relevant to the majority of the population through their preferred channel, which was primary care and Aboriginal community control health services. That is why we have prioritised access to Pfizer through Aboriginal community control health services really early. In fact, the first primary care sites um, that um, access Pfizer all up um, outside, uh, and that adding general practices, Commonwealth vaccination clinics and ACHOs where Aboriginal health services. And we currently have 84 um, Aboriginal community control health services administering Pfizer across urban, regional, rural and remote. And we are seeing a very significant uptick of vaccination rates in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Anecdotally, um, a vaccination blitz that was conducted uh, as joint approach by the local Aboriginal health service, uh, the Royal Flying Doctor's Service and uh, WA Health 
in the Ngayan Chara lands uh, last week. Um, saw uh, 500 vaccinations administered in, in, the, in those communities in one day. And I think uh, one or two people in the entire community uh, declined to receive the vaccine, which is a much better uptake than average. Okay, thank you, Senator Davey. Can I go to Senator Keneally now? Senator Keneally, we can't hear you. Hang on. Yeah, we can hear you now. Great. Thank you. Thank you to the officials for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, Professor Murphy, we've just heard from the New South Wales Premier uh, that there are 136 new cases in, uh, New South, in, in, Sydney, in New South Wales today. 53 people were infectious while they were in the community and there has been uh, one death. Uh, would you characterise this rapidly developing situation as a national emergency? Look, I might get Professor Kelly to answer that as the Chief Medical Officer. I think it is a very serious situation, but Professor Kelly is, is right across it. Um, yes, thank you, Senator Keneally. Uh, it's a very serious situation, in, particularly in South West Sydney, but not only in South West Sydney. It's a, it's a, and there are several elements to that. I think, uh, as we know, South West Sydney is a very diverse uh, community. Um, it, it contains a lot of the people that work uh, in that community are in, indeed essential workers for the entire um, Sydney Basin and beyond. People that work in distribution centres, people that work in construction, people that work in aged care, uh, etc. Are, are all in that very diverse and, and, and rich community. Um, the challenge has been, and it continues to be for New South Wales, is that the the normal things we've been uh, used to doing in, in relation to this virus uh, in previous iterations of the virus before we had this particular Delta variant of concern um, are, are proving to be not as effective uh, as, as has been in the past. Uh, this is, we are not alone in this experience. The Delta variant has spread to well over 100 countries all around the world and every country that has this variant is experiencing the same thing. I know uh, that the New South Wales health officials are working extremely hard. They're very engaged with the community, uh, but it is, a, it is an enormous challenge. And even with the, the, the lockdowns that we've seen so far, and they are very strict, um, it is proving difficult to get this, uh, this particular outbreak under control. Mm. Uh, well, the New South Wales Premier, uh, Gladys Berejiklian, has um, described the situation in New South Wales and particularly in southwestern Sydney as a national emergency. She has now uh, advised residents in the Cumberland and Blacktown LGAs that they are unable to leave their LGA unless they are an essential worker, bringing to five the total number of LGAs uh, that are in this lockdown, this extreme lockdown situation. Um, Professor um, Kelly, you were just there discussing the importance or the, the challenge, I should say, and the importance of the number of essential workers who live in that portion of Sydney. Uh, the Chief um, Medical Officer in New South Wales, uh, Dr Chant, is now calling for uh, the vaccine to be prioritised for um, essential workers who are under 40. Uh, is that something that has been raised with the Commonwealth? Yes, it has, Senator. And what is the Commonwealth's response? Uh, well, we, we, I, I speak to um, Dr Chant at least three times a day, and we've been in close contact with her again twice this morning uh, and last night. Uh, the night before, um, Professor Murphy and myself uh, had a long conversation with her and, and relayed her concerns uh, around these matters. Um, uh, to others, um, and those conversations are ongoing. And General to Fru others, what does G that General mean? Fru to is others. In, is well, in discussion with New Fru South Wales about yeah. that, that issue, Senator. General Fruin is, doing, is in discussion with New South Wales health authorities about uh, essential worker vaccinations. Is there anything you can enlighten us on here, General Fruin? Uh, no, I'm in uh, close consultation with the New South Wales authorities. We're looking at a whole range of options 
uh, about how we can support them in relation to vaccine rollout specifically. Um, Maybe worth talking about. From your view, up. are there priority groups that we need to consider? From your view, General Fruin, General Fruin, uh, is there any refocusing on specific priority groups uh, that you're starting to consider as a result of the national emergency that's occurring in New South sure. Wales? So, of course, vaccines are only one part of the response to an outbreak like this. Um, and uh, lockdown, testing, tracing, isolation, social distancing, masks, all of that is uh, you know, really critical in this sort of situation. Vaccines underpin a national uh, health response. Uh, right now, we are working specifically our task force with New South Wales health authorities on how vaccination response can be uh, focused. Initially, we've been working on the three LGAs and the surrounding areas to the LGAs. Uh, remember, we're also working with uh, jurisdictions uh, elsewhere, Victoria, South Australia, wherever these sorts of things are happen, we have a look at exactly uh, what can go on. Right now, we are working with New South Wales on a number of uh, priority uh, areas. We've over 70s, of course, aged care, and we've talked about some of the response um, to aged care already with the roving uh, clinics that we have doing aged care. Uh, doing a lot of work to encourage um, over 70s to continue to get vaccinated as the most uh, vulnerable sort of community group. Uh, we're working uh, with industry right now on food distribution hubs. Um, and workers in those areas. Uh, we're also working uh, on other sectors such as the uh, construction industry right now. Um, so we're engaged, we're working through it. Uh, we're, we're working to open up as many possible avenues again for uh, vaccination. Uh, we're focused on uh, what the Commonwealth hubs can do, GPs, pharmacists. I've said we'll have 48 pharmacies opened um, uh, in, on Monday in those LGAs. Uh, we're also working with the states on how we can provide either support to their clinics or whether we can provide, uh, from their resources, we can provide support to our GPs as well. Uh, General Fruin, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the, the Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, has said uh, today in her media conference that the, she's calling on the Commonwealth to, quote, refocus the national strategy uh, for the vaccine rollout. Uh, she says that uh, one of her priorities is to have more first doses of Pfizer given the younger age profile of southwestern Sydney. Is that something that has been raised with you? Uh, it, it has been uh, raised this morning and we're having discussions around that. I mean, dosage Intervals is one of the many tools in a response. I'll leave my uh, health colleagues to speak about um, the, the benefits and impacts of that. I mean, there, is, you, there are decisions to be made around whether uh, it's better to have people fully vaccinated or whether it's better to have perhaps people uh, with single dose vaccination in relation to transmissibility concerns. But yes, we're, we're looking at that at the moment and we're looking at how whatever New South Wales authorities decide around this, how we can support them. So in, ter mm. in terms of that, Senator, I might just add, add there, there, uh, one dose is better than zero and two doses are better than one. Um, but in, in an outbreak situation like this, you need to balance all of those things, as, as the Lieutenant General has said, um, about which would be the best way of, of protecting the vulnerable and decreasing the transmission, recognising that, that the vaccines themselves would not immediately do either of those things. And so that, that is why we need both both the public health responses, state responsibility, with the with the vaccines as we can assist. Um, just yeah. on priority populations, just in the last week, I've I've had I've had and and um, Lieutenant General Fruin has his own list, but I, I have a list of uh, many, many different uh, essential workers. They are all essential. They are all a priority, but we have to prioritise within that prioritisation. And we've, uh, I've asked today uh, specifically from New South Wales Health to, to really give us some very detailed information about particularly those that are still infectious in the community 
uh, because that's what's driving the pandemic or the epidemic uh, in, in southwestern Sydney. Mm -hmm. I, I, I suspect and I, I believe that most many of those are essential workers. We need to know what those essential workers are, their, the specifics of their situation and, and make an appropriate policy response on the basis of that information. And Senator, as the lead of the national vaccine rollout, I think it is really important that we continue at speed with the vaccine rollout broadly across the nation. Uh, yes, there is a, uh, a, a particular concern right now in those LGAs in Sydney, but as you would appreciate, they can spill out of those areas very quickly. Yeah. Outbreaks are already yes. occurring in other parts of the country, so uh, it's always a balance, and uh, I'm, I'm very keen that we manage national vaccine rollout as fast as we can while providing whatever focus support we can to the specific outbreaks. Uh, thank you, because I did want to get to that before my, my, quest, my allotted time here expires. Um, because, but first, the Premier has said it's clear that we are not going to be close to zero by next Friday, uh, at, you know, foreshadowing that the, the lockdown that we are currently experiencing here in Sydney is going to continue beyond next week. What is a time frame here that would be realistic uh, in terms of when some of these decisions will be made? The decisions about essential workers, the dis under 40, the decisions about more first doses of Pfizer, um, given the younger age profile? Well, we're making decisions every day. Uh, as I said, some of those uh, workforces I just mentioned, uh, we've made decisions yesterday about uh, getting to the food distribution hubs as a priority. Uh, we've made decisions yesterday about getting to workers as a priority. This is an ongoing dialogue. The situation, uh, you know, changes by the hour in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to reiterate, of course, uh, General Fruin is, is, is absolutely correct. We need to um, take this particular issue in southwestern Sydney and beyond to a national sphere. So we have uh, lockdowns, as has been mentioned, in Melbourne and the whole of Victoria and in South Australia. Um, they've both been seeded from this outbreak. That can happen at any time. Uh, in, in other states. So we, whatever, whatever decisions we make, of course, flow on to uh, opportunity cost in other areas. And that has to be absolutely and very carefully considered. I was going to ask about that, the, the impact of redirection of vaccines to New South Wales. Would that have an impact on other states? Uh, if, if vaccines were to be redirected from other states, absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, I've mentioned earlier we're rolling out GPs as a priority. Uh, we're rolling out uh, additional GPs with Pfizer as a priority and additional uh, pharmacies focused on AZ right now. Uh, the strategy we're taking in New South Wales, I've got the 48 that are going into uh, those LGAs. Start, they're already gone in starting early next week. Um, we have then got a ring of uh, additional things going in around the LGAs and then around uh, remote regional areas in New South Wales. So we're we're taking an approach that if, uh, you know, God forbid things start to spread out from those LGAs, that we've also put in place things that will help contribute to containing it as well. So um, it's a layered strategy uh, and constantly reviewing our approach and priorities. Uh, can I ask one more question? I'm mindful of my time. Thank you for your answers so far. Um, some feedback that some of my colleagues in particularly in um, western and southwestern sydney have had from gps is that they're not they're not entirely sure how supply is calculated for individual practices they, they just receive what they receive um and it, i'm trying to understand one the process for allocating supply to GPs, but two, also, the Prime Minister did say that he would ramp up supply to southwestern Sydney. Um, do you have supply volume figures by a um, primary health network in Greater Sydney that could be supplied to the committee? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll reiterate the broad principles and then I'll let uh, Dr Dutoka sort of speak to the detail, but the we are allocating vaccine supply on a per capita basis across the nation, so each of the states and territories are given uh, a, a proportionate allocation. With Pfizer, we have made a decision that all available Pfizer will be distributed and provided to the states and territories up front, as was agreed at National Cabinet. So uh, Dr Datoka can then talk to the specific allocations that you were uh, seeking. But right now, we have AstraZeneca available because uh, supply is exceeding demand with AstraZeneca, although demand on AstraZeneca is 
rising by the day. Uh, at the moment, we don't have surplus Pfizer because the decision was to allocate all Pfizer out. So the jurisdictions are responsible for managing their allocations of Pfizer with their particular priorities. And we have been pushing Pfizer down through the GP networks. Uh, but again, in each of the states and territories, you have these two main distribution networks, the, the primary health care network and the state and territory networks. General. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Um, allocations for general practices are advice to their practices well in advance. Uh, for AstraZeneca, we commence with a three-tier allocation structure based on the available supply, but subsequently, as the program rolled, rolled in, uh, we continuously increased it up until um, um, about a month ago when all practices were brought into either a 400 a week allocation or a 600 a week allocation, noting that that is the maximum allocation that they're able to order. Practices can make a choice to order less than that. And with um, um, varying supply of AstraZeneca, many practices have ordered less than what their allocated total is. However, we have been responding very proactively to any request for additional uh, vaccine that we have been receiving. There's been 139 requests from general practices in the Greater Sydney area for additional AstraZeneca supply that have been all honoured and have resulted in an additional 36,000, 5,700 doses of AstraZeneca have been delivered to those GPs. For Pfizer, we've <coughs> commenced with a two-tier allocation in which practices uh, receive a total of either 150 doses a week or 300 doses a week, although they commence with half of those um, and they scale up as they stabilise in first and second doses. What we have also done is we've reached out to uh, GPs e that are doing Pfizer in Greater Sydney and 70 of those have requested us to uh, up their allocation from 150 to 300, which we have put in place as part of their uh, focusing efforts that uh, General Fruin referred to. Okay, Senator Keneally, I will have to hand the call on. Thank General, you. just before I get to Senator Seward, have you, has the government, it might be to Murphy, uh, Professor Murphy, has the government tried to purchase more Pfizer in light of the outbreaks that we are seeing across the country? or tried to bring forward more of the purchase um, over and above the announcements that were made a couple of weeks ago? Absolutely, Senator. We are working uh, almost every day with Pfizer. Um, and uh, as you're aware, we've, we have increased our supply now to a million doses a week. But with the Minister Hunt and uh, uh, has been working with Pfizer. The Prime Minister and Minister Hunt have written to the global CEO. Prime Minister has uh, uh, has has spoken to the global CEO. Uh, we have, uh, uh, but obviously those discussions are, uh, are, are confidential, commercial in confidence. Sure. But what I can say that we have been working with Pfizer uh, at every opportunity to try and see if we can uh, uh, bring forward doses. They have a very clear. Uh, national prioritisation that they plan. They've got the whole world to supply and they allocate their doses in a very... And they have never failed to deliver what they've offered. Sure. And we are now slowly increasing our supply. So we continue sure. to work with But Pfizer. is it about buying more or bringing forward? The, What's we, we don't need to buy any more, Senator, to complete our vaccination of all first doses or f fully, fully know, vaccinated. But would it bring... If we had another deal to buy more, would it bring no, uh, some here now? There is no, Pfizer have never said that, it, that an additional purchase would enable that. They allocate out right. months okay. ahead. Okay. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, can I first go to then, if we can't get more Pfizer, what can we accelerate the timeline, for example, to get more um, Moderna? We've already heard that Novavax is having problems with supply. What's the timeline for getting or bringing forward uh, access to the Moderna uh, vaccines that the government has also contracted for? So Moderna are currently uh, committed to provide some doses in September. Um, and we, again, will continue to work with them to explore if their production volumes increase, whether they can give us more earlier, and again, we, we, we're working with all the companies that we have contracts with, to, but at the moment, uh, their commitment is only to give us some doses in September. How many doses in September? About a million at the moment they, they, they are offering in September. But we will so get. A million they have, for the month. Sorry? For the, for in the month of September. Month. That's what. But we will get more clarity from Moderna as we get closer to the time. Most of these companies 
do a, a sort of a, a monthly projection globally and we will continue to work with them to see if we can uh, get any more. But at the moment they are only committing to a million in September. Um, and as I said, uh, uh, the, these companies have been very reliable. Uh, they don't want to overcommit, um, but obviously if they can, they will do what they can to bring forward doses. And do you have an idea about when, or do you have any uh, notification from Novavax about when they expect to be able to deliver? Novavax are currently uh, promising to deliver some doses in quarter four. Uh, uh, we don't exactly know. Uh, it will be some millions of doses in quarter four, but they are still, uh, because they, we don't have full registration yet and we don't have a clear production timeline, uh, our current plan uh, is not dependent on having Novavax for our primary vaccination course this year, but they, they are still committing that they will give us some doses in the fourth quarter. If they come, uh, that will be valuable and that could accelerate, but our plan is not dependent on having Novavax this year. Thank you. I think my next lot of questions are to the TGA and to Atagi. Mm -hmm. um, today there was uh, Professor Skerritt the announcement around uh, children approval uh, for Pfizer for approval for the children in the age of 12 to 15, I think it was. Can I ask um, yourself? And I need to. I would like to understand the process from here. Does that Atagi, does that have to go to Atagi as well, or is that now uh, so? Can be so, Senator, uh, the, uh, the two roles of TGA and ATAGI are different. So, TGA's approval yeah. means that the balance of benefits to risk are highly positive. So, it we've made the decision that, based on all the evidence submitted to us, that the vaccine is safe and effective for children over 12 years old. As per any vaccine, the decisions on which populations it's most appropriate to prioritise for are made by ATAGI. And this is not just with COVID vaccines, it's with other vaccines. So as we heard earlier, uh, there are a range of approaches used globally from the US vaccinating pretty much wide range of high school kids through to the UK saying, well, let's give it to kids who might have particular disabilities or, or might be immunocompromised, but let's not open it up yet to every high school kid over 12. So Atagi's job here, and I should, our Atagi colleagues are on the line, is to actually work out which populations within the broad group over 12 that we've determined as TGA, the vaccine is safe and effective for. So can I then go to Atagi, please, and ask, um, how, what's the timeline for you considering that and which populations do you consider should be prioritised? Professor Blythe will answer. I'm, okay. I'm happy to, and thank you for the question. So, uh, Associate Professor Chris Blythe, co-chair of uh, COVID uh, working group within uh, ATAGI. So, ATAGI is considering this advice at the moment. Now, clearly that's contingent on the TGA registration. That is now, that has occurred. Um, we will be considering this over the next a uh, short period of time um, to get clear recommendations out. Um, now, also, I think we need to consider those recommendations given the fact we still have limited Pfizer supplies as well. So we will need to give clinical recommendations of if there are populations of adolescents that are recommended, which populations, and importantly, are there specific high-risk children that are, should be first in line as opposed to uh, other children. Yeah, okay. and, and what time, you said you're considering that, what timeline do you expect? And have you already considered those populations you just talked about in terms of those most vulnerable? Or, you know, how, we, have you already considered those groups that you think you should be targeting, we should be targeting first? This is under consideration at the moment. We, we are likely to be meeting up next week, um, but importantly, we're waiting on further information before we can land on our, our final position. I don't expect significant delays here, but um, I, I, I think uh, this committee would be respectful that this needs an important decision to make um, and one that we will uh, need to consider uh, before the broader target. 
sort of information, you, you said you needed, you're waiting for additional information. What sort of information are you waiting for? So there's an, a number of important pieces of information here, clearly understanding what the registration looks like and, and that will be reviewed in detail um, now that the TGA has made that. Um, we will be and have already spoken to a number of the international uh, uh, you know, other countries that are looking at rolling out programs in adolescents to understand their thinking and importantly understanding our local epidemiology. Particularly are there groups of children at particular risk who should be prioritised ahead of a broader program? Thank you. Um, can I go to very uh, quickly to a paper and I think, I'm not sure whether it's to ATAGI or to TGA, sorry, so I'll ask you both. There's a paper I think from Germany, admittedly that hasn't been peer reviewed, that talks about uh, the, or looks at the, the connection between TTS and the way the injections are administered and it missing, for example, with the item going into the blood supply. Have you looked at that part and is it that, that further? Uh, we have uh, looked at that. I'm aware of a paper that you refer to. It, as you indicate, it has not yet been published and one of the challenges of the COVID pandemic and uh, we saw this sadly with a lot of papers that initially looked very promising with hydroxychloroquine but uh, when the data was reviewed and larger studies were done the, the, the data sadly didn't uh, show overarching benefit. But so I, I am cautious about their conclusions but their conclusions do have implications for adenovirus vectored vaccines writ large in that uh, they're proposing that differences in the processing and differences in the movement of the uh, product into the nucleus of a cell could cause, uh, could be a mechanism of action of TTS. Now, while clearly there seems to be an immune uh, component to the reaction to TTS, I think it's fair to say that there's a range of hypotheses about how TTS uh, arises. So, but that German group has one view, but uh, I wouldn't say it is universally accepted as a view. It'll be interesting to see how that paper is refereed and what commentary there will be after we assume it will be published. Professor Chang or Professor Blythe might want to comment further on that. Yeah, I can, I can probably add to that. Um, so um, I think the study that you're referring to, uh, Senator, um, is a, as a mouse study and obviously it's an experimental study and you can't study that um, uh, in humans to the uh, same degree, obviously. Um, but um, there are some key differences, um, obviously, other than mice being different to humans, is that the, um, the side effect um, that was seen occurred very early in mice, and that's very different to how we see it in, in humans, where it tends to occur at least after four days and, um, and usually um, you know, even many weeks after that. So um, the, the generalizability of those, find, of those experimental findings in mice um, to humans isn't um, entirely clear. They do have theories about why that might be different and so on, but um, it isn't um, as clear cut as uh, that this is the same syndrome that they see in mice that, um, that we see in humans. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask then in terms of, um, <coughs> We've heard that the Prime Minister has been constantly asking Atagi to reconsider his advice. Can I ask, is in fact that been happening and what's your response to that? We, um, well, we were asked to um, continue to review the evidence about um, TTS and other um, adverse events related to AstraZeneca. Um, Atagi has been meeting um, every week um, and has been putting out a statement every week, um, updating advice. Um, most recently, we met uh, yesterday and a, oh, sorry, on Wednesday, and um, a statement is, uh, from that is uh, expected shortly. Can you uh, enlighten the committee as to what that what your most recent advice is going to be or is? So, so um, it basically will reiterate um, uh, the previous advice, so there's no change um, in uh, what the advice is, but there are some updated uh, figures um, uh, that um, the TGA have um, uh, up, uh, updated us on. Um, that doesn't really change uh, the balance of risks and benefits um, in terms of uh, the risk of TTS. Um, obviously, the, um, the benefit of vaccination, particularly in Sydney at the moment, is, um, is somewhat in a state of flux. Um, we provided advice on the 13th 
13th of uh, July about um, the use of AstraZeneca in the, in the context of um, outbreak situations. Thank you. Um, I would like to go to uh, looking at uh, the issue around aged care and aged care workers and ask under what the Prime Minister's announcement around mandating the vaccinations uh, for aged care workers, under what state and Commonwealth powers does the Commonwealth, uh, how's the Commonwealth going to enforce that and under what powers? Um, the Commonwealth and the states and territories. So the agreement, Senator, at National Cabinet uh, was that the states and territories would uh, mandate the vaccination under their public health orders, which is the way that we did it for influenza vaccination last year. Um, the agreement was also that the Commonwealth, through our aged care, uh, system would be monitoring um, the vaccination rates and reporting on those vaccination rates and would be responsible for ensuring compliance. But it was seen to be, because it is a public health issue, um, it was seen that the best way to do it was through state and territory public health orders and all states and territories uh, have, have agreed to progress that. Uh, and that there, there, there is, it would be possible to use Commonwealth powers, but they, they might need legislative change or the use of the Biosecurity Act, and it was seen to be better to use public health orders. Senator see what you just yeah. got a minute, couple of minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, my understanding is that, that that does not include home care workers in aged care. Not, not at this point, Senator. It was felt that the uh, mandatory approach um, was AHPPC advice was taken on this and the advice of the Aged Care Advisory Committee, which guides AHPPC, and their, their advice was that the higher priority was age, residential aged care workers. Professor Kelly can talk, but they are continuing to reviewing uh, to see whether uh, that could be expanded, for example, to residential disability or other workers. Given the high infectious nature of the Delta uh, variant, is that being How urgently is this being considered? Given that these workers, both aged care and disability, are going into people's homes, and it's happening right now, um, all over Australia, but particularly also uh, in New South Wales. Um, so I'll, I'll just add one thing and then uh, ask uh, Lieutenant General Fruin to talk about what he's been doing very actively in this space in terms of increasing the, the take up. But um, you, you're quite right, uh, Senator see what this, this is uh, a new variant. It does have different challenges as I've, I've, I've spoken to. Um, uh, but we, we continue to be committed to, to protect those most vulnerable uh, people directly with vaccination. Uh, and the workers that, that uh, every day have to go and, and assist them uh, with vaccination. Uh, and we've, uh, Professor Murphy and, and Lieutenant General Fruin have already spoken to um, the challenges in relation to that. But JJ, do you have any? Yeah, uh, aged care workers is uh, one of our top priorities inside the task force right now. And we have developed a very specific plan to ensure that uh, we get all aged care workers uh, fully vaccinated by uh, mid-September. Um, we are. That includes. That's, sorry, to be. I asked about home care workers. I've heard what you've uh, said about resident care workers. I'm talking about home care workers. So home care workers are definitely in, in our priority group, and they have access to all of the vaccination services that uh, uh, General Fruin has initiated with. The exception of uh, inreach, obviously, you can't do inreach into a home care environment. So they, we are certainly making vaccination available to home care workers of, of any age. But the, the the priority again, because we it has been uh, residential aged care, because that is the by far the biggest risk transmission environment. You will recall, even in the Victorian second wave last year, there was almost no. Uh, cases in home care. It's the residential care environment that's the highest risk, which is why National Cabinet, on the advice of Age PPC, uh, decided to prioritise residential aged care workers. There is a, still an ongoing focus on the rest of the disability care workforce and the 
uh, home care workforce, but the priority is the residential aged care workforce. Okay, I'll Senator Seawood, I'm going to have to jump, cut you off there. I will come back to you. Um, Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you very much for all the work that all the officials are doing. Uh, these questions are to the department. Um, I'm interested in picking up on some of the comments made about the Delta variant. Um, I think there was a reference made before about this has not been successfully brought to heel by any, any government uh, yet. Can you talk a little bit about some of the lessons uh, that we are picking up in real time about how we can manage this Delta variant, please? So I, I might answer those, um, Senator. So, um, so look, it's the same virus. Um, so many of the, uh, and it's a, it's a respiratory virus. We know how it spreads. Uh, it spreads as people move around. It spreads when people uh, cough, sneeze, breathe. Uh, it mainly goes via the air. Um, so all of those things are the same for for this particular variant compared with, uh, you know, other other diseases, for example. So all of the things we've learned along the way about how, how we deal with respiratory viruses uh, are still valid and we're still doing them. The difficulty with this particular variant uh, ha is that it has definitely become more transmissible. That is, it can move uh, more, it, more quickly between people. Uh, it appears that uh, people with this virus, particularly and specifically if they're not vaccinated, um, are, uh, they, they carry more virus. Uh, and so um, the spread of the virus is increased through that uh, mechanism. Uh, they appear to become infectious earlier uh, than previous variants. Um, and uh, that infectiousness starts earlier, so even before they develop symptoms. Now, we've known that all the way along, but it seems to be more prominent with this Delta virus. Um, so all, all of those things mean that getting onto uh, all the things we've been doing since the beginning, the contact tracing, the testing, um, the isolation, doing that as quickly as possible, uh, as has occurred, is occurring right now in South Australia, it has occurred over the last uh, week or more in Victoria, um, at the, so far, and, and indeed early on in New South Wales, they were also doing that, getting onto people very quickly um, making sure as much as possible and hopefully 100% of the time that people that develop uh, infectiousness uh, become positive to the virus are already in quarantine uh, themselves. Uh, what we're seeing there is that in, in households, and this is happening in southwest Sydney right now in particular, in households it's almost 100% of the household become infected themselves. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's very much different to previous, uh, previous iterations of the virus. Um, so that key, key figure that is, is mentioned every day uh, in the press conferences is that the, key, the two key figures that we need to watch. Um, are the cases linked? Do we know about all those chains of transmission or are there so-called mystery cases in the community? And amongst those in particular, um, but also the ones we know of linkages, are they um, in isolation or in quarantine uh, before they become infectious. Uh, th those are the key metrics. The actual numbers themselves, um, you know, we will expect that they will grow, um, but that we need to see those two figures going down. That, that shows control. Unfortunately, at the moment in New South Wales, that is not the case for either of those particular metrics. And do you have any updated numbers on uh, case numbers and deaths uh, from offshore on the Delta variant? Is that information that you have? Um, so yes, we're watching um, other countries uh, um, that uh, are experiencing similar waves. And I, I would say that um, there are many countries in the world that are, that are now uh, grappling with, um, with Delta uh, virus. It's become essentially the virus for most of the world now. Uh, it's the variant that is more transmissible means, means that it has a, a, an advantage over previous, um, previous variants of the virus in terms of it uh, spreading from person to person. And that's, they're, they're the outbreaks we're seeing. So we can, we can watch those. We're, we're particularly and specifically interested in those that have, have high vaccination rates already. So uh, Israel uh, undergoing a, a Delta outbreak at the moment. They've, they have gone back to some of their, uh, their more blunt public health um, arrangements, uh, including lockdowns. Um, the UK uh, have 
you know, quite um, pub publicly and famously this week uh, moved away from lockdown measures and so forth, despite the fact of they're having tens of thousands of cases per day. Um, mm -hmm. It's mostly in younger people, mostly in the unvaccinated. Um, and, uh, and, and whilst there are some severe cases in the, those age groups, it's way, way less than their previous waves. So if you look, look at their wave of cases, that looks very, starting to look very similar to their two previous waves in the UK. In, in terms of numbers, uh, it's mostly in younger people, um, but their hospitalisations, ICU rates and, uh, and deaths have not risen as they did last year and earlier this year. So that's a vaccine effect. In, in, uh, in the United States, they're seeing a similar increase. Um, that's particularly related to under, uh, under vaccinated areas. And, and in the, UK, in the US, um, that's, that's very much related to, um, uh, to the urban poor and to other places where there is not, uh, not as good access to vaccination uh, or uh, a, a large degree of hesitancy. So we're, we're learning from all of those examples and we need to make sure that we're addressing those in our vaccine rollout. And, and um, uh, Lieutenant General Fruin has already um, mentioned some of those strategies. But it is worth mentioning that the UK is having about 50 deaths a day and the US is having about 400 deaths a day, um, which uh, despite high vaccination rates, which is really good evidence of the uh, this this Delta variant. Are they dying from? They're dying from Delta, are they? The Delta is the predominant strain in in, in those countries. Yeah. And they're okay. largely unvaccinated people, aren't they? In in in, in the main, the, that's the data we, we we believe. Yeah. In our in our local yes, data here, and you know, tragically, we've had some deaths in in uh, Sydney in recent recent times. I, I don't know the details of the one today, but um, the, all the previous um, deaths um, from age 50 up to 90, late high 90s, uh, have been in unvaccinated individuals. Okay, so can I just ask before my time expires? Um, given that vaccination is the key uh, to getting out of this. Um, I mean, what, what is your current advice to Australians eligible to get a vaccine? In a nutshell. Very, I think our <laughs> I think advice would be very much consistent. consistent. Please turn up and get a vaccine. Um, uh, so particularly if you are over 60, we have plenty of AstraZeneca, plenty of points of presence. You can get an appointment very, very quickly. We're rolling out, General Fruin's rolling out more points of presence. Go and get that vaccine. The risk benefit of vaccination uh, for AstraZeneca in the 60s and over is way, way, way in favour of vaccination. Those under 60 who want to get access to AstraZeneca, it is available. It, you need to have informed consent and many, some General Fruin can give the data on that, but a certain significant number of younger Australians have taken it up. And those who are currently eligible for Pfizer, in the priority groups and in the over 40s, please book in for your vaccination. General Fruin can talk Since, a bit. Since uh, AstraZeneca was offered to the under 40s with informed consent on 28 June, 43,132 young Australians have chosen to take AstraZeneca. Can, can I just reiterate what, uh, what Dr Murphy said? As the Chief Medical Officer, this is not the time to uh, hesitate. Uh, Anyone who's eligible for vaccination should be looking to get that first vaccination if they haven't already done so. I particularly say that to the people of Sydney, but, but throughout the country. Uh, anyone who has had a first dose of AstraZeneca should, at whatever age, should go and book in for their second dose, or they should have that booking already. Do not cancel it. If you have concerns, talk to your GP or your other health provider. But um, we know that two doses of AstraZeneca, including against this Delta strain, are very effective at, at preventing severe illness. And that is what we're really uh, uh, honing in on. It, our TAGI uh, colleagues may want to comment on this, but they, they provided extra, extra uh, and changed advice in relation to the dosage interval for AstraZeneca in, in the situation of an outbreak. So that is specifically in Sydney, but that would also be the same in Melbourne and, uh, and in Adelaide now. Um, would be to have it, have it earlier, so the four to, to eight weeks after their first dose. Uh, this is not the time to hesitate on a second dose of AstraZeneca. Is that you done, Senator Bragg? Oh, just, just, just finally, quickly, so just for the record, 
is it ultimately the choice of the consumer under the age of 60 uh, to decide whether or not they want to have AstraZeneca? Absolutely. It is, it, and atagi has been very clear about this. The vaccine is registered for all people over 18. They have said it's preferred on the risk benefit for, to have to prioritise the under 60s for, for Pfizer, but is absolutely open um, to any person over 18 to have AstraZeneca, provided they understand the, the, the very small risk of clots and the benefit versus the, the benefits of vaccination. And those benefit, that equation, that risk benefit equation, as Atagi has said on many occasions, depends on the epidemiological circumstances. And certainly in Sydney now, that benefit risk equation has changed, as Atagi has indicated. And AstraZeneca is available right now across the nation. I went on to the eligibility checker yesterday. Um, I was able to get a next day booking for AstraZeneca here in the ACT. Uh, I am already fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca, but right now in New South Wales, AstraZeneca is available. We are providing more distribution nodes for AstraZeneca uh, and people should make that informed choice. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Just before we um, break, uh, just in light of some of the uh, evidence we've had this morning, Professor Murphy, from where I sit, we've got a national emergency in New South Wales that started with an outbreak um, from the quarantine system. We have five council areas in New South Wales in a severe lockdown. We have some 14 million Australians living in lockdown today. We have the slowest vaccine rollout in the developed world and only 12% of the population vaccinated. We don't have enough of the preferred vaccines for our population and we don't have targets for the vac vaccination program. 70% of people over 70 are not fully vaccinated. We have a leaky hotel quarantine system that's not fit for purpose. We have caps on international travel and those, are right, those caps have halved and yet we have 36,000 Australians stranded overseas who can't get home. We've got kids missing schools, families missing funerals and weddings, people struggling to pay their bills. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is opening up. The Treasurer also is now pointing to a negative economic growth for next quarter. Surely at the end of that, the federal government's management of this pandemic is failing, isn't it, from your point of view? And do you join with the Prime Minister in apologising to the Australian people for the suffering that they're currently going through? Well, Senator, for a start, I would the outbreak in Sydney was not due to a failure of quarantine. It was due to transport of air crew and a, a public health failing in a transport. There was no As leakage part of from the hotel. quarantine program. Well, it, driving to the was, quarantine. It would, would, the same would have happened whatever facility was being used for quarantine. So it was not a quarantine failure. And uh, certainly I join with the Prime Minister in saying that we are, we are sorry that the vaccine program has been delayed by the unexpected events that have happened. But I point to the successes in our vaccine rollout and I refute the general contention of your statement. Which parts do you refute? That the, I think our management of the pandemic uh, would be regarded internationally as one of the best in the world. We have had some issues with the pace of our vaccine rollout but I would much prefer to be in Australia rather than any other country in the first world. Look at the number of deaths in England. Look at the number of deaths in the UK. We have largely lived a normal life for most of this pandemic. Certainly this Delta variant is stretching us now. Our, our, we have been in most of the country back to normal when parts of Europe and the UK have been locked down for several months. Our management of the pandemic has been very strong and based on the best medical advice. I would separate the management of the, of the initial response to the pandemic to the vaccine rollout. I think that's we've had a good response to the pandemic in its first phase and then we're in the place we're in today because the vaccine rollout hasn't done what it needed to do and the quarantine system is not fit for purpose and that's what's led us where we are today. Well, I would refute the contention okay. that the quarantine system is not fit for purpose. And I think the vaccine rollout, we have had some, some challenges that were beyond our control, but it is going very strongly now, a million doses a week. General Fruin can tell you we've had another record day in the last 24 hours. Mm. People in New South Wales might feel a bit differently today. Um, we might break there and come back at 20 past 12. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator.
interrupted. I would ask that uh, I'm going to go to Senator Watt. I know he has questions for Atagi. I understand Senator um, Patrick has some questions for Atagi. So my intention is to go Senator Watt and Senator Patrick. I also have been advised that um, General Fruin and Professor Kelly must leave at 1.30 to attend to matters uh, prior to National Cabinet. So um, as Chair, I'm happy to facilitate that. Uh, but it might just mean that we have to shorten some, some uh, questions. And I uh, just want to give people forewarning of that. And I'll try and be as fair as I can and prioritise non-government senators in light of the shortened hearing, as government senators, of course, have other avenues to elicit information. Um, right, we have everybody at the table. Senator Watt, you've got the call. Thanks, Chair. Uh, most of my questions are for Atagi, but I do have a couple for the TGA and others as, um, as well. Um, and just starting with a, um, regarding your uh, vaccine weekly safety report from yesterday, and that obviously sadly revealed more blood clot, uh, clot cases. Are the events that were set out in yesterday's report consistent with your previous understanding of the risk factors for adverse events, such as age and gender? Uh, so that's actually the TGA weekly uh, safety report, Senator, that was released. Uh, yep. It was consistent. I mean, uh, We've been comparatively fortunate, even though every death, of course, is very sad, that uh, our rate of death with uh, adverse events, the TTS syndrome, has been so much lower, say, for example, than in the UK. The UK is averaging a 17 or 18 per cent, and even with the most sad two cases reported yesterday, we are still down at 5 or 6 per cent. So uh, cases will... With, with small numbers of cases, two cases can suddenly change a percentage very quickly. But the pattern of adverse events is consistent with the past. Uh, it's, it's quite clear that uh, the severity of the adverse events are greater in, uh, in, in younger people. So not only are the number of TTS cases relatively higher, and not, not by a, an astronomical margin, it might be by 50 to 80 per cent higher, depending on which age cohort you go, say under 50 or under 60 versus over 50 or over 60. But what is noteworthy is that uh, women in particular, and women under 50 or 60 in particular, have more of a severe adverse events with TTS. Four of the five deaths have been in women, uh, and uh, that pattern is similar to that uh, observed in the UK. Thanks uh, for that. And um, to Dr Cheng now, uh, I think you pretty much indicated in answer to Senator Seward earlier that it's not likely that ATAGI will be providing any changed advice uh, on AstraZeneca in the immediate future, whether it be in response to the TGA's report or anything else, is that right? Yes, although I would emphasise that um, so the, the risks of uh, TTS are now becoming um, uh, known, or at least the, the estimates of that risk are becoming more precise. Um, but obviously the other side of that equation, the benefit, is uh, very different in different parts of the country at the moment. And clearly the benefit for someone, uh, you know, being vaccinated in, in Sydney is uh, very different to, you know, Western Australia, for example. Sure. So, and I'll, so that's, I'll come back and that's to the that. basis of our advice from the 13th of July is in that context, people need to consider that, um, that benefit. Yeah, I'll come back to that point in just a moment. Um, before I do, though, the, the point about community pharmacies, this is probably best for Dr Kelly. Um, yesterday, the Prime Minister indicated that community pharmacies across the country will be eligible to request participation administering AstraZeneca to the Australian population. Was any medical advice provided to government regarding the expansion of informed consent consultation through Medicare to community pharmacists? Uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer that part about Medicare, but certainly, yes, I, I can absolutely say that, that medical advice was sought, but, um, but my colleagues here would have more to, more to say about the actual mechanisms of how that's going to work. I, I probably, actually, probably all I really need to know is that advice was provided, and it sounds like it was. Um, so, Dr Cheng, uh, is the ATAGI advice to government that pharmacists can give informed consent for those under 60 
years of age who are wanting to get AstraZeneca? So we've not provided advice on um, who can uh, give informed consent. Um, so in our uh, recommendations from the 8th of uh, April, um, we recommended that the Department of Health uh, develop and refine resources for informed consent that clearly convey the benefits and risks, um, but not who is um, able to uh, uh, give that. And, and clearly, that is a, you know, that is a matter of um, uh, preference for uh, the consumer, um, as well as um, you know, who's providing that advice to make sure that they um, are confident that the uh, consumer, that their patient, um, uh, is aware of um, what the risks and benefits are. Right. So, so back to the department then. In that case, if a targi hasn't provided advice to government about um, pharmacists being able to provide informed consent um, for those under sixty, has the department provided any advice to government about that? Uh, Senator, so the advice from a targi uh, about obtaining informed consent from a health professional is what has been included in the communications from the department. Um, in the informed consent, which is a process, not, not, not a form, happens through a variety of health professionals and the GP-led uh, parts of the rollout also have a multidisciplinary team that includes nurses and other professionals, including pharmacists. In terms of the clinical governance arrangements for community pharmacists to form part of the rollout, those are being governed uh, by state and territory regulation and the Department of Health has been working with each state and territory um, for the framework that supports uh, and governs um, clinical conduct in their uh, community pharmacy rollout. There are some states that have granted uh, broad regulatory approval for the accredited pharmacists to provide these or, or both vaccines in different settings. Some states have restricted it to particular age groups such as people 60 years and over, um, but that is a, a joint process, but ultimately the regulation of authorised immunisers is uh, governed by each state and territory jurisdiction. Right, so I suppose the bottom line is by the time we see community pharmacists rolling out AstraZeneca, will the systems be put in place for consumers to obtain in informed consent and provide informed consent if they get that vaccine through a community pharmacy? Every clinical encounter requires of this matter uh, whether it's over 60 or under 60, requires informed consent, Senator. The clinical governance arrangements that have been put in place uh, for the community pharmacy aspect of the rollout are not dissimilar to other parts of the rollout. Community pharmacy went through a process of declaring uh, meeting requirements of a target and uh, a pretty robust assessment by the pharmacy program and administrator, and those pharmacies that were deemed suitable are the ones that have been approached uh, initially as part of that rollout. The specific uh, regulatory arrangements for community pharmacy and for pharmacist administration of the vaccine uh, are done in partnership but are ultimately determined by each state and territory gov uh, government. We, there, will no, there is no part of the rollout that um, takes place that is not governed by strict uh, clinical governance arrangements uh, according to local jurisdictional regulation. Okay, can I just come back to um, ATAGI advice? Um, Dr Cheng or Dr Blythe, uh, has has a target been required to hold any urgent meetings to consider advice at the request of the Prime Minister or others in government? Uh, we have uh, been, I'm oh, sorry, um, uh, we've been um, uh, requested to uh, meet weekly um, by, um, by government and we have been doing that. Um, obviously, as the situation changed, particularly around the 2nd and the 8th of April, um, uh, with uh, the cases, you know, the first cases of uh, TTS that were reported then, um, uh, we, I think both everyone came to the realisation that we needed to um, uh, to review um, that evidence very quickly. Um, I think that was at uh, the request of um, AHPPC. Right. So have there been any requests directly from the Prime Minister or uh, Ministers? to hold meetings outside of the weekly process? Um, I'm, I, I'm just trying to think of, uh, so particularly early, um, we had uh, met, and that was before that we were asked to meet weekly. Um, I'm not sure that we have been met, asked to meet other, outside of that. Okay. Alan, I can, jump, I can jump in there for the Senator as well. We, we have had uh, additional meetings, uh, for example, um, a meeting on the 12th of uh, July, uh, which was the Monday, um, particularly to review the outbreak uh, in New South Wales. Clearly, we are, uh, are watching the epidemiology very closely. At this 
stage. Uh, and so that was a meeting to uh, look at whether a string advice um, was required, um, which was uh, subsequently published last week. Okay, the reason I ask is that a couple of days ago, the Prime Minister said in a press conference that uh, it's a constant appeal, that, that he and others are making a constant appeal to Afagi to review their advice on the basis of circumstances that are arising. Is that, has that been your experience, that there's been a constant appeal, whether it be from the Prime Minister or other ministers? I had interpreted that to mean that um, we are being asked to uh, keep a very close eye on um, uh, developments, both in terms of um, the changing epidemiology of uh, COVID in Australia, as well as emerging evidence of TTS. And uh, we have done that. There's, that's not based on a personal representation or anything from um, the Prime Minister, but I understand that um, we are uh, expected and um, we have been uh, keeping a very close eye on the situation. Right, so any, any decision of ATAGI to review its advice has been by its own decision rather than as a result of appeals from the Prime Minister or others? Senator, what we're in constant communication, particularly uh, with the department. Um, so, uh, and so uh, we're understanding the pressure that is being putting upon this committee and we meet regularly to, to, and in an ad hoc basis as well um, if uh, there are things to be considered. Okay. Um, and in brief terms, can you just explain to us why it's important that uh, the advice ATAGI provides is independent of government? Um, I would say that um, the advice that, um, uh, that we're being asked to consider is of a, a very highly technical nature, um, you know, to um, we've had to understand this TTS syndrome. Um, we have to understand the epidemiology of it. We uh, um, have to understand what are the risks and whether there are particular risk factors and age and gender and so on are part of that. Um, and then we have to weigh that up against the other considerations. So I, I think it would be fair to say that they are um, highly technical um, considerations uh, that do require um, expertise and um, that expertise um, uh, is you know there is a process to um, uh, to um, obtain that expertise, and that's uh, for vaccines. It's through ATAGI, um, through, but for other matters, there are other expert committees for that. Right. Um, you probably would have seen again. The prime minister told reporters yesterday that quote I want to get AstraZeneca vaccines in people's arms to protect them, their families, and their communities. Um, and he went on to talk about that. Does the ATAGI consider that those statements are consistent with its health advice? So, so I think we have um, said from the beginning that um, there are there is a, a group in which um, uh, the benefit of AstraZeneca um, are well and truly outweighs um, the the risk from that. And at the moment, that is um, everyone over sixty. Um, so, for anyone who is um, over sixty, um, particularly those who are in Sydney at the moment, um, you, you know, we would very strongly recommend, and even more strongly than before, recommend that they get vaccinated and with the available vaccine, which is. Um, AstraZeneca. We've also said that um, you know, for all the other groups, um, you know, people who are in priority groups, um, uh, healthcare workers, and so on, um, they need to be supported, and we would really urge them to be uh, vaccinated as well um, with uh, the available vaccine for them. For people under 60, that uh, would be uh, Pfizer. So, but I think in the particularly in the context of an outbreak. Um, where the risks and benefits are changing. So again, we try to provide advice for all of Australia. If you're a farmer in Western Australia that um, you know goes to the town once a week, your risk of getting COVID is very, very small. It's not zero, but it's it's very, very small. The benefits of vaccination and the risk benefit um, assessment in that context is very different if you're a taxi driver in uh, um, uh, in Fairfield or um, sure. Blacktown at the moment. So that's that's I guess the struggle that we're trying to um, put uh, to to convey. But because of that changing epidemiology, particularly in Sydney, um, we would really urge everyone um, who's under 60 who um, either has access to uh, Pfizer, who's already been booked in, or people that don't have access to Pfizer, um, they really should um, think about that actively um, to see if um, that uh, risk and benefit um, is uh, such that they should be vaccinated. Yeah. I had a look at the advice that you provided on the 13th of July, and in essence, uh, 
as you say there, uh, it's basically saying that um, people who are under 60 um, who do not have immediate access to Pfizer should reassess the benefits of AstraZeneca. So really the reason that people are being encouraged to reconsider AstraZeneca is because of the lack of Pfizer. That's if, there, if, if we had the Pfizer, if we had enough Pfizer, people wouldn't be requ required to make this choice, would they? Well, I can jump in there, Senator. Uh, the reconsideration is also because clearly the epidemiology is changing. People may have come to the conclusion a month or two ago that in the changing epidemiological context, those risks have changed. What we're really asking people, imploring people, particularly in those high risk areas to actually, your risks are changing and they will continue to change as uh, the epidemiology changes. You need to constantly reassess your risks and that is basically your risks of getting COVID and your ability to access vaccine. Okay, just last question. The, um, is a target, there's been a bit of commentary about um, and confusion about the vaccines that pregnant women should be um, taking. Is ATAGI considering putting pregnant women in phase B? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, I understand that uh, that decision um, was uh, noted by uh, National Cabinet and um, they are, um, pregnant women uh, will be part of uh, phase 1B. That decision has been made. So that, yeah, so the, um, the considerations early on was that um, before um, large numbers of large numbers of uh, pregnant women had been given a vaccine, um, there was a, um, some uncertainty about the, um, uh, the risks and benefits in um, in that context. Um, but um, there have now been uh, quite large studies um, that have looked at the safety of um, of uh, um, uh, COVID vaccines in pregnancy, as well as uh, further data about the risks um, of uh, COVID to pregnant women. And now um, that uh, risk benefit is now um, more uh, clearly on the side of, um, of uh, getting pregnant women uh, vaccinated. So pregnant women are now in phase B? I understand that's being operationalised at the moment. I don't know if uh, the general might be able to um, shed light on that. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, yes, Senator. Um, and uh, communication has gone out to general practice uh, via uh, initially via GP webinar yesterday um, and throughout last night and this morning through a bulletin to all general practices uh, confirming the eligibility of all pregnant women in line with Atagi's advice and their national cabinet decision um, so that all pregnant women, regardless of the stage of pregnancy um, and whether they're eligible for other reasons or not, um, can access their vaccine through uh, the primary care channels. Okay, um, Senator Watt, I'll have to leave it yep. there. Um, I'm just, again, Senator Patrick, you've got questions for Atagi, is that right? And, and, and I'll start with Atagi first. Okay. I've only got a couple. I'll just check with Senator okay. to see what you had, you asked questions of Atagi last round, didn't you? So we're gonna let them go after Senator Patrick. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, go Senator Patrick. Thank you. And I'll just ask the Atagi questions first then. And, and the questions really go to mixed dose uh, schedules, whether or not we're considering those like, uh, you know, Canada, for example, have got uh, AstraZeneca for a first dose and then turn up for uh, Pfizer uh, four weeks later, as opposed to the 12 week delay. What's happening in that space for Australia? I'm happy to speak to that, Senator. So we are watching these data very closely, as you're aware. A number of countries have got mixed dose programs running at this stage. We have issued advice that there is specific indications for mixing, uh, such as those who've had a previous adverse reaction to their first dose or specific conditions. We're continuing to watch uh, mixed dosing as part of a more general program, um, and we will We'll issue advice of that uh, uh, in the in the future. But what we are recommending at the moment is the best approach, best approach for the Australian situation, given our, the quality of the data that we have, and importantly, the supply we have is using same dose, first dose and second dose. So that's why we're really strengthening the recommendations. If you've had an AstraZeneca dose first, particularly in an outbreak situation, you need to be coming forward for your second dose. But ATAGI is watching um, internationally and reviewing the data about the mixing and matching of programs. So again, that, that comes down to simply the lack of supply, because it's clear that if you can get people double vaccinated in four weeks, um, 
even if they start out with AstraZeneca, that might help the situation, for example, in, in New South Wales? I think it's more complex than supply um, um, with respect to Senator. You know, we, we have, you know, one, there's always a supply issue, but also um, it's about the, where the data is at the moment. As you see, a number of uh, countries are moving to this, but some countries have not moved to this. So we are, we are watching this closely. Okay. Um, uh, noting that there is a call on for, um, but from the New South Wales Premier today to treat New South Wales differently in the sort of regional response, recognising their circumstances are different to everyone else. Uh, surely that has to be part something that would need to be considered. You'd have to be providing advice uh, to cabinet, to national cabinet in relation to that, um, because it is a way of expediting protection. So, so we have provided advice previously in, say, in our statement from the 13th to say any additional unallocated supplies of vaccines of either type should go to outbreak areas. Um, and But it, it, the operationalisation of that, um, it's probably best spoken to by the department rather than ATAGI. You know, ATAGI is very much focused on trying to make sure those areas at greatest risk have as much possible protection as possible. Sure, but ATAGI's role here, rather than the, the, the operationalisation of, of the vaccine, is certainly to give advice as to the suitability of these mixed doses. Sorry, I may have misunderstood um, uh, your question, but um, so we have provided advice on um, bringing forward the second dose of um, AstraZeneca to between four and eight weeks to try and improve that um, protection that uh, that um, uh, that uh, provides against particularly the uh, Delta strain. Um, we at the moment we uh, so mixed doses uh, mixed sorry mixed doses um, we understand to mean one dose of Pfizer and a second dose of AstraZeneca sure. or, or vice versa. Um, we don't recommend that at this stage. Um, uh, partly because um, the, the weight of evidence is not there to support uh, that. So there are, um, you know, tens of thousands, the trials of tens of thousands and millions of people that have received two doses of the same vaccine, um, but only probably a few hundred um, that uh, have received a mixed schedule. So one dose of one and another dose of another. The, um, there are obviously reasons why some people may need to do that. So if you had a severe allergy to your first vaccine, you, you clearly can't get that one again. Um, so that's a perfectly valid reason why we might um, support um, mixed schedules, but um, uh, not as a routine. Um, and, and okay, just a, a last question for a target, and then I'll move elsewhere. But um, uh, what, what's the latency between AstraZeneca, uh, a first jab, and a uh, and or Pfizer um, first jab? and some effectiveness. So, so um, the data suggests that um, uh, protection uh, starts about 21 days from um, the first dose of AstraZeneca um, and, uh, and then for Pfizer it's about 14 days after the uh, first dose. So, so that again lends, lends weight to perhaps what the New South Wales Premier is suggesting that you, you need to get Pfizer into New South Wales and I'm not suggesting that's the right answer but, but there would be some scientific basis around her call. I mean, I think the priority would be to get any vaccine into, um, you know, first dose into anyone, um, and whether that seven day difference makes a huge difference to public health control, I'm not so sure about that. Okay, thank you. That's it for a target for me, Chair. If you want to release them, then. Okay, I'll just, just, uh, just, I had Senator Davey who had a couple of quick questions, I understand. Senator Davey? Yes, they haven't thank, been asked. thank you, Chair. Um, just for a time, I just want to um, get a bit of an understanding um, of your broader work. When when you're providing advice for other vaccinations, such as flu shots, do we and uh, do you provide advice uh, regarding which shot might be better for different demographics with other vaccinations? I'm happy to answer that, uh, Senator. Yes, we do. Um, so, you know, a flu is a good example. We recommend one vaccine, such as an adjuvanted influenza vaccine for older people, because we think that's more suited to older people. We recommend a different vaccine for uh, children and young adults. So, you know, Atagi's role is to look at the evidence supporting one type of vaccine over another and to align that with different population groups, whether that be by age or by risk factor. Um, Thanks. And, and when you, when you, because we get flu shots through pharmacies as well, so you provide that advice and that goes out to 
pharmacies to all the, the GP practitioners and wherever you can get those vaccinations. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Davey. Uh, that means witnesses from ATAGI can depart now. Thank you very much for your time uh, today and your assistance with the committee's work. Much appreciated. Uh, Senator Patrick, you have three minutes. Sure. Okay. Knock yourself um, out. Uh, thank you. Um, in relation to uh, the minister's uh, claim about uh, Pfizer arriving uh, last week and this week, can you give me the actual numbers, what arrived last week and what arrived this week? In terms of just as a, as a whole, whole of population? Level. No, no, just understanding what, what arrived in country. So the okay. minister had suggested... Yeah, the million, the million doses, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll get that very specific okay. information, Senator, it's just coming into the room. Yep. Okay, and where, where did that arrive to? Is it in New South Wales, Victoria? Where is it actually physically located? It physically came into Sydney, Perth and Melbourne. Okay, and uh, noting that you had a plan or would have had a plan for a rollout of only 300,000. Uh, we've now had an extension to a, to a million. What are you intending to do with the additional 700,000? How are you distributing that? Yeah, we, uh, we've already, uh, we pre-made those distributions on uh, advice of the confirmed delivery schedules. And as per current arrangements, the uh, allocations were made proportionately across the states and territories on a per capita basis. And then we made a distribution through uh, state uh, networks and through GP networks. In the okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. So, so, so there is now being uh, put out by the New South Wales Premier, and there's been some interesting press conferences today across both New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, I presume that there must be some planning in place, uh, some modelling as to whether or not to approach the Pfizer vaccine rollout uh, on a regional basis in circumstances where we have what we're happening in uh, you know, what is happening in in Sydney. There must be at least uh, some have been some consideration, some modelling of that. Is that is that the case? Uh, I wouldn't categorise that modelling as occurring, Senator. I said we we are doing a national vaccination program. It is important that we vaccinate the entire nation concurrently. Uh, in relation to hotspot uh, management, uh, as I've said to the committee earlier today, vaccination is but one part of how to approach hotspot management. Lockdown is fundamentally important. Testing, tracing, isolation, of course, have remained essential throughout this pandemic. And then other measures such as social distancing, masking and all of that. Vaccination underpins the national resilience to COVID it is not the best way to provide immediate health response to an outbreak like this. Our priority for dealing with an immediate outbreak like this in terms of vaccinations is to go to the most vulnerable communities, and that is what we have done. We have deployed uh, roving clinics into the aged care sector specifically to make sure that we have got the highest possible levels of vaccination uh, in the aged care sector. Uh, at the moment, we are working on uh, encouraging all of those over 70 to get their dosages done with AstraZeneca if they haven't done so already. And we've spoken to some of the uh, other high priority cohorts that we are, we are seeking to provide additional vaccines to. But suddenly deciding to throw a particular vaccine at one geographic area does not give you an immediate solution to a problem. OK, so if we, if we see that answer come out of National Cabinet, it's, it will have been done so not on, not on advice from the department. The, so, so the, the approach is, is the, the vaccines are provided, the Pfizer vaccine is provided on a per capita basis. To get reallocation of Pfizer from other jurisdictions would, re, would require the concurrence of the other jurisdictions. Um, so that would be the sort of conversation that might take place. But uh, as I'm at the moment, I am not aware of New South Wales making a case to the other jurisdictions as to why uh, other jurisdictions would uh, seek to prioritise their Pfizer to New South Wales. Okay, Senator well, Patrick, do you have that, a final question? Well, that just seems to have been the nature of the press conference. I'll just go very quickly to, to uh, um, Dr N uh, Murphy. Um, you, you sort of indicated uh, a, a sorrow in relation to uh, the the, uh, the way in which this has panned out. Um, I just wonder, are you reflecting on 
uh, how this has occurred? Uh, uh, and if so, what are the things that you would do different, would have done differently? And if you're not reflecting on it, why not? Senator, of course, we reflect on the decisions and the, the expert panel that has made advice on purchases has also reflected on decisions. It's all very, one can always use retrospection, but I, on the basis of the evidence and the data that we had at the time uh, when we made our initial purchases. I think the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee feels that they made the right decisions at that time. Now, obviously, if we'd known that AstraZeneca was going to have this clotting issue, um, the, our decisions might have been different at the time, but, but one, can't, one can't always predict the future. We had a, a, a diversity and a redundancy of supply and a strong dependence on local production and the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee, the large committee of experts, uh, feel that the decisions made were made on the basis of evidence at the time were the right ones. Okay, um, Senator Patrick, we'll leave it there. Uh, General, so there is no, like based on your answers to um, Senator Patrick, there is no extra Pfizer available to go to New South Wales that hasn't already been allocated across the country. From time to time, we have minor amounts of Pfizer yeah. that are available because of unders and overs, and we manage those on case-by-case -case basis. I currently have got formal requests from South Australia for additional Pfizer. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, I don't have formal requests from New South Wales for additional Pfizer. I've had informal requests. Okay. Yeah. Seems pretty formal <laughs> was put out today, but you're not. Uh, well, I don't not take requests through media. No, uh, fair, Senator, yeah. fair enough. But if, but. You don't have your general's reserve, I think you. Not at the moment, no. Right. That's part of the, of the new campaign there's no, plan. There's no covered. No, right. no. I've got AstraZeneca, uh, and yeah. we are working hard to get as much AstraZeneca into New South okay. Wales right now. And and just sorry, the campaign plan that you're going to take to national cabinet and the operational review of the vaccine program. You say you're going to release the plan. Are you going to release the operational review of the vaccine program? The. The plan is the result of my review, Senator. Right, but the review itself. Presumably there's a review that's led to the campaign plan. That's how it reads in your opening statement. Uh, no, the, the review was the process that we went through to write the plan, Senator. Okay, so yeah. there's no review document? No, no. Right, okay. So the campaign plan, and that will be released following National Cabinet. Is that your intention? Uh, it will be released as soon as uh, I'm able to release it after National Cabinet. There are a couple of things now, like the recent advice uh, from uh, on 12 to 15 year olds and Pfizer. Yeah. So we will wait now for the formal advice on that, and then we may seek to make some adjustments to the okay. plan, for example. And then as soon as we can after that, then I intend to release it. Yeah. Okay. But it's not a decision of National Cabinet to release it. It's your decision. No, no, it? it's going to National Cabinet for noting this okay. afternoon. Okay, yep. thank you, Senator Seawood. Thank you. Uh, um, can I? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, can I go back to where we left off in terms of home care workers? And Professor Kelly, you were making the point um, earlier around uh, AHPCC advice. My question then goes to, have you gone back to AHPCC in light of the, the Delta variant spreading uh, now in three states? Have you gone back to them to then seek advice on whether home care aged care workers and disability workers should now be uh, high priority and in fact be mandated for vaccination as oh, that that vaccination be mandated for uh, home care workers in both the aged care and disability sectors. Um, so uh, it's an ongoing discussion, Senator, about uh, about prioritisation. I, I, I would say, and just to reiterate what uh, Dr. Murphy said earlier, um, that the highest priority um, within the priorities uh, that we have. Um, were, were people in residential aged care and residential disability care. The reason is twofold. One is they are vulnerable in, because they're vulnerable people because of their illness or age um, profile, but, uh, but also because they're in the residence. Uh, and so it's that crowded nature, 
understanding that the virus moves between people, the more people you have in one area. So they are definitely the, the key. Um, but then, as I said uh, earlier, I've, I've got, a, I've got the, this list of people that, have, that are priorities at the moment. So I've got respiratory technicians and doctors in private practice. I've got teachers and their families, construction workers, FIFO workers, freight drivers, airline um, uh, employees, and in particular, um, flight crew. Um, employees of West Farmers, of Coles, of Woolies, uh, cleaners in various high-risk settings, frontline emergency workers, call centre staff, families of healthcare workers, distribution centre workers, Uber and taxi drivers. That's just in the last week that people have come forward. I think the point is everyone's a priority right now. We need to get on with the vaccine rollout and the, and the quicker we can do that, the better. Uh, and so whilst we're, we've got that eye on the vulnerable, it's also the transmission element which we're seeing in Sydney in particular, and, and um, Lieutenant General Fruin has already spoken to that about the discussions we're having with New South Wales to get specific information about that, uh, as well as protecting the vulnerable. So there are these multiple strands. So, uh, you, thank you for that. You did not ask my answer my question, however. Have you gone back to IHPCC for updated advice in terms of older Australians receiving home care and, and disabled people receiving uh, care in the home. I'll con come to congregate settings in a minute, the disabled people. Yeah, so, so that, that is part of the advice we've provided to National Cabinet um, on at least three occasions. Uh, and we've been tasked to come back again with disability uh, care in, in particular and, and not, not just in residential care. Um, so they are ongoing discussions. The last time we, we gave information to National Cabinet, if I'm, I'm just, there's been quite a few um, meetings recently, but I think it was about two weeks ago, um, uh, was when Delta was already here and already circulating specifically in New South Wales. So it was in that context. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms then of when we can expect to see further advice for home care and disabled people, when is that likely to be? So I, my so in ter in terms of disability care, there is that is coming back uh, next month um, for further further advice to national cabinet. Uh, in terms of uh, of home care, that's not specifically on the agenda, but it's something we're we're looking at um, continually. So did you say home care is not actually on the agenda? Well, they're a priority group, like all the other priority groups, but AHPPC has not been tasked to look specifically at home care. That's true. Workers, I'm talking about workers, I understand um, older Australians are a priority, but home care workers, are they a priority? Yes. Thank you. In terms of disability, uh, in terms of the advice on, on disability, are you providing it on uh, workers in both home, in the, the care for people at home and in congregate care? Yes. Thank you. What's the time? What are we talking about? Early next month? Um, I only have August next month. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Can I go specifically to the issue around the um, Park Lee group home, where um, people have disabled people have contracted uh, COVID? Can you tell me how many people firstly? Uh, how that outbreak occurred, please. Just uh, ask a colleague to come up. Thank you. Hello, Senator. I'm uh, David Mulhall, the first Assistant Secretary uh, Disability Rollout and Vaccination Task Force. I have some notes on Park Leaf. Give me one moment, please. I'll just find them in my notes and give you the detail. Okay, thank you. Do you have another question, Rachel? Well, yeah, I do. Um, in terms of the number of people who have in home care in New South Wales, how many people, do you have the figures on how many people have COVID in home, who have contracted it while in home care? Take We'd have to take that one notice, Senator. We only we have data on the residential care 
workforce. I'm, I'm not aware of home care workers contracting in New South Wales, but I would have to take that on notice. Professor Kelly, if he doesn't know from his HPPC discussions, we'd have to check with New South Wales Health. But we, we do have good data on residential care workers, and there have been a number of those who have contracted COVID. I'll come back to that in a minute. Could I please then ask on notice for home care workers and, people and, and older people who are receiving the care? We'll take that on notice, Senator. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can we then go to back to the issue around uh, Park Lane, and then I'll come to other issues around that. You've really, uh, you've only, you've got about five minutes left, Senator Seward. Okay, I'll have to put lots on notice. Yeah. All right, Senator, thank you. I've got the information here. So there are four group yep. residences located alongside each other. There's a total of 21 residents uh, within those four group homes. Of the 21 residents, uh, 19 have had one dose. Um, Sometimes you can be. Senator uh, Patrick, could you mute your microphone, please? Sorry, Mr Mulhall. Thank you. Uh, 19 have had one dose. Uh, two declined to be vaccinated. Of those 19, 14 had AstraZeneca vaccination <laughs> through their local medical centre back in May with the second dose already booked for in for August. Since then, Aspen visited that same facility on the 12th of July, and they administered Pfizer to the balance of the residents, together with 10 staff. Okay, what I mentioned, could you tell me how many people in Park Lee have actually contracted COVID? My understanding, uh, Senator, uh, and I don't have this morning's information, so forgive me if it's moved on since last evening. Uh, we understand three have tested positive and we're awaiting results for a, a further two. And how did COVID, uh, how did it occur? How did the infect occur? How did it enter the facility? Uh, Senator, I don't have that information available to me. I'll take that on notice, but I, I don't have that information to me. Was it a worker? I don't have that information, Senator. I'll take that on notice. Why don't you have that information? Surely this is vital information. Uh, Senator, the monitoring of individual cases is managed through the uh, National Disability Quality Safety Commission. Uh, I don't, as a matter of rule, track every case. Indeed, the task force does not track every case. I anticipated this question, but to be frank, I don't have that individual personal information available to me. Uh, but given the question has come up, I'll take it on notice. Senator Seward, I think the officer has agreed to take it on notice. Um, yes. Um, update on one of the previous questions okay. from Senator yep. Seward. Yeah, so, so we understand there is one home care um, resident in New South Wales, the current New South Wales outbreak so far. Okay. Senator Seward, do you have a final question? Uh, just on that one, do we know how that uh, home care resident uh, contracted COVID? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. No. Do you take on notice? I'll take it on notice. Sure. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Professor Kelly, you have to leave it at 1.30. So I've, I've just got a few questions for you. I wrote to you the other day and you replied. Thank you very much. I'll just um, table that uh, for the committee's um, benefit, uh, the correspondence. But I just have a, a couple of questions that come out of it. So. The ACT has been COVID free for over a year, thankfully. Um, and we've got many MPs in strict lockdown at the moment. They arrived a week, you know, five days ago. Um, so I am interested in the conditions that are around the Prime Minister's um, movements around Canberra. Um, having, he's have come from Greater Sydney into the ACT uh, and he's operating on a different set of arrangements than other MPs are allowed who aren't really even allowed to open their doors. But I read your letter. Firstly, has the ACT, does the ACT government have to sign off on these conditions? And if so, I note in your letter you say you've reached a common understanding with Dr Coleman, but have you, did you reach agreement? Did they sign off on the uh, arrangements that were put in place for the Prime Minister? 
Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for your letter, um, yeah. Senator, and I understand your concern for, for ACT residents. I'm an yeah. ACT resident as well, so um, thank you for that. Um, in terms of the understanding with the ACT Chief Health Officer, um, Dr Coleman and I speak on a day, at least a daily basis. Um, yeah. And quite a lot of that discussion is relate, related to the safe operations of this place. Yep. Um, and so the common agreement that I referred to in the letter was in relation to the, the Australian pa Parliamentary House. Right. Um, not not, not to the specifically the, the arrangements around the Prime Minister. So, Correct. So you manage that, do you? Is that under your responsibilities? So th this, um, we... We, uh, you, you will understand specifically the, the statutory nature of yeah. Chief Health Officer in yeah. the ACT and also the, the, um, uh, the complexity of that arrangement in relation to the National uh, yep. Capital Authority. Uh, so, so the way I look at it is that, that um, uh, Dr Coleman has, has absolutely uh, and a very important statutory responsibility for the protection of the ACT population many of whom work in Australia in, in yeah. the APH. Um, the presiding officers of the APH actually ha are the ones as a workplace that have the responsibility for the safety within the house. Yeah. Uh, I have no statutory responsibility, uh, but on, okay. from time to time I'm asked for advice by the Prime Minister in relation to yep. these matters, and so I provided that advice so, on last weekend. Okay, yep. yep. And so you, you've provided the advice which is what the Prime Minister's following, presumably, uh, in terms of how he's conducting himself and the arrangements that are put in place around him? Well, of course, advice is taken and then how that, how that is used is up to the individual that takes the advice. OK. So, I mean, because I'm trying to understand how what, the way he's conducting himself is in adherence with the public health emergency direction that's been put in place by the Chief Health Officer for which other MPs are abiding by, strictly. Mm -hmm. And you're saying there isn't really a legislative framework or a power for which that it's operating. It's done through some goodwill and, and negotiations. Correct. And so the, the other document you have there in front of you is countersigned by me with, yeah. with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Dr Coleman, and, that's, okay. and that relates to the protection of the ACT community. What the, the letter that you've just tabled is, is specifically advice for the Prime Minister um, at his request. Okay. Um, so I think in your letter it's, and, and, and it is different to how he's operating from when he's done his overseas travel, when he has remained at the lodge. He is moving between the lodge and here. And then two days ago, he did a press conference at the lodge where a whole lot of people came in to a quarantine zone Presumably someone's monitoring that and monitoring the people that came into the quarantine zone after they leave, is that right? So those people that came in were having to be subjected to any testing or uh, monitoring? So I gave advice along those lines on, on, on uh, the weekend. How that's being actually uh, operationalised and implemented is not my uh, responsibility. So whose is it to, to like do the testing that's required under the other? guidelines that have been issued for parliamentarians? Well, the, the Prime Minister's office and the um, Prime Minister and Cabinet um, would be the ones responsible for that. So we've got this public health directions for essential parliamentary business, which sort of outline a, a, a range of things that have to happen and movements for people in which, you know, including daily saliva testing. Do you know if that's happening? Um, so that's, that was my advice specifically to the, to the Prime Minister and also those directions you have in your yeah, hand there. But no one's monitoring that, as far as you know? Uh, well, I'm not monitoring it. So who would be doing that? That would be the ACT government's responsibility, would it? Uh, so the ACT government, so just to put the Prime Minister's elements aside, but for the, for the, parliamentary, uh, for, for the parliamentarians themselves, yes, they are involved with that and monitoring. For the Prime Minister? Uh, the Prime Minister, I'm, I, I'm not involved with the implementation of those particular arrangements. So we have someone who's undergoing quarantine here, who's allowed to move from his place of residence to his workplace and have contact with other people. Have you met with the Prime Minister? 
uh, whilst no, he's been doing quarantine? No, I have not. And and there's there the the just the in terms of the press conferences that was very specifically, and you'll see outlined in my letter my advice about how to make that as safe as possible, yeah. uh, and that is so that people they are held outside, people are wearing masks suggested that people should uh, should be vaccinated and they should be having daily tests. And that was the advice I yeah, gave. Yeah, but you don't monitor that because presumably some of those who went there weren't fully vaccinated. Uh, I, I have no way of knowing that, Senator. OK, so it, your job really is you provide advice and then it's over to the Prime Minister and his staff about whether they follow it and you, we don't know who's monitoring it at all. Well, I, I'm not monitoring it. Can, it. can I just say that there are constitutional issues here in terms of, of no, the I'm ability aware. of... No, I'm aware. I'm, I'm yeah. aware of those, mm. just as all of the colleagues of mine and presumably the government who are locked up and following this, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of them locked up who are not allowed to leave or who are not leaving their mm. apartment. And I'm trying to understand what the rules are for the Prime Minister. For example, I think part of your letter was that um, you know, to minimise travel and, and impact on APH, that the press conference should be at Parliament House, at, at the lodge. Yet then the Prime Minister came to Parliament House that afternoon to take part in the Olympic announcement. It would seem to me then, you know, how, how is that being, how is the sort of spirit of your letter being met by that approach where, you know, it's not minimising travel, and in fact, we brought a whole lot of people who are in APH down into a quarantine zone who then return to APH. Well, I, I would categorise the quarantine zone as being inside the lodge. Um, but the, the point is, I have no... Uh, I, I've provided advice on this, but in terms of, uh, of decisions made, in terms of what is, uh, what is or isn't um, uh, parliamentary business, as it, as it is suggested in the Constitution, exactly, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but there are there are there there are parts of the constitution which actually say that no one has the power to stop MPs doing what they need to do to no, run the country. No, but throughout the pandemic, we've all caught the fact that we should, in the interests of keeping communities safe, take the health advice. And your health advice is outlined, but we don't know if in, if the prime minister has been taking it. But we do know that every other MP in quarantine is doing it because they're getting checked by the police and by ACT Health through testing arrangements. And I really thank them for doing that. Yeah. It is keeping well, the, the ACT course. population safe. And we've got 14 million Australians in lockdown trying to follow the rules, and yet we don't know if the Prime Minister's been following the rules and we don't know if he's having testing or any of the other advice that was put in your letter. So, um, don't know. Or so, anyone who's having contact. I'm presuming he's having contact with quite a lot of people. Well, as you'll see in the letter, I advise that that should be kept to an absolute minimum. The reality is that in all the places that are currently under lockdown, there are, there are exemptions for essential work. The question is about the nature of that essential work. Um, and it is the nature specifically of the parliamentary triangle which makes um, those sort of decisions difficult, and that's why we do it in, in, in collaboration with ACT Health um, and uh, the advice uh, okay. to make it as safe as possible as I have given. Okay, so just to finish this, you provide advice, but there is no role in, under your responsibilities to monitor if that advice has been adhered to, and, and as we know, unless ACT Health are doing it, no one is monitoring that advice. Um, so ACT Health does have a role in terms of in some of those testing arrangements, but just to make I'm it clear that that advice was, asking my, about the Prime was Minister. my advice. It was my advice, not not from ACT Health. Okay, and um, ACT Health and the Chief Health Officer has not agreed with or signed off on the uh, advice that you provided for the Prime Minister. I, I, I've informed the ACT uh, Chief Health Officer about that advice. I've, uh, as I yeah. say, in, 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 con in very close uh, and frequent communication with her, but that was the advice but I she was didn't, asked. But she didn't agree to it. You, it was, it it was, was my, here is the advice. It was my advice. Okay. As Did you requested. provide her with a copy of it? Uh, she, no, she, she was not provided with a copy. And why is that just. It was a. It was a piece. Of, it was advice to the prime minister under his request, from his chief health oh. chief medical officer. So it was advice to him. Okay. Um, I, find, I think people in quarantine will find that really difficult to understand. Um, Senator Keneally. Yes, 
thank you very much to uh, I have, and thank you again to the officials. I have some questions in relation to quarantine. Uh, to Professor Kelly first, um, at the April 27th hearing of this committee, your evidence was that hotel quarantine was fit for purpose in your professional opinion. Uh, given that we've got almost 14 million Australians now in lockdown and a highly infectious Delta variant, is that still your professional opinion? Yes, it is. And so you are not changing any of your current medical advice uh, on the appropriateness of the continued use of hotel quarantine? Uh, no, I'm not. We've given uh, on many occasions, in fact, I would suggest every occasion we've appeared before this committee and other Senate committees in recent uh, months uh, to that effect, and I don't see any reason to change that advice. I'd, I'll, I'll reiterate what Professor Murphy has already mentioned, that the current situation in New South Wales was about uh, a limousine driver who should have been vaccinated, should have been wearing a mask, uh, should have been having daily testing, uh, and had not. That would have been the same wherever that, that person was working in relation to people arriving from overseas, and it was nothing to do with hotel quarantine. The, the case that is, is, has, has caused the outbreak in South Australia was someone who had returned from, from, uh, from South America, uh, who had gone successfully through their 14 days of hotel quarantine without uh, the only hitch being that they were unwell and needed to go to hospital, contracted the Delta virus from the outbreak in Sydney, not in hotel quarantine, uh, and took that into South Australia. Um, the, the Victorian outbreak, uh, as has been very widely uh, talked about, started with a, um, a, a removalist van coming from southwest Sydney, nothing to do with hotel quarantine. So I, I, I reject the, the con conjecture that the 14 million Australians, and my heart goes out to them about their lockdown, uh, is due to a failure of hotel quarantine it is patently false. Mm. We've had, uh, not, notwithstanding the evidence you've just provided, we have had 26 breaches from hotel quarantine, and I am going to come to the transport workers, the limo driver and the other in a moment. Um, but we have had uh, leakage from the hotel quarantine. Um, if it is the case that hotel quarantine remains fit for purpose, why have the caps on international arrivals been halved? Uh, so that was a decision of National Cabinet, uh, and I'm not going into how, why that decision was, uh, was uh, brought to be, because it's a Cabinet in confidence matter. However, um, I was asked by the Prime Minister prior to National Cabinet about my uh, opinion about caps, uh, and I did offer the, the what is fairly an ob obvious suggestion that if you decrease the people, the numbers of people coming in, you would decrease the number of people that are positive for the virus uh, and decrease the opportunity for the virus to be transmitted into the community. Um, the decision, though, about caps, I would reiterate, was a National Cabinet decision agreed by the Premier's uh, Chief Ministers and the Prime Minister. It does just seem somewhat contradictory to say we have this fit for purpose in your advice and, and Professor Murphy's advice, you know, perfectly safe system of hotel quarantine, but yet we have to have the number of caps on arrivals, particularly at a time when we have 36,000 Australians still stranded overseas. Let me ask you this then, if hotel quarantine remains fit for purpose, why has the Commonwealth resolved to build facilities in Mickleham, in um, the Army Barracks in Queensland, or, and in Western Australia? So firstly, to take you up there, Senator Keneally, I, I, I and I'm sure Professor Murphy have never said that it's perfect. No system which is as complex as the hotel quarantine system or the quarantine system more broadly, including Howard Springs uh, dedicated facility, uh, would be seen as perfect. They certainly are um, extremely complex, uh, and we've seen uh, throughout those breaches that you mentioned multiple reasons why those breaches have occurred. And as I've given extensive evidence to this committee previously, we are doing, we are, we are having a, we have a continuous quality improvement approach through the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee. As recently as yesterday, we have a dedicated meeting to talk about quarantine and what has been learnt. 
Um, part of that announcement from National Cabinet about the, the decrease in the caps also included an announcement about a second Halton review, and that's, uh, that's uh, yeah. already underway. Um, in and terms when, I was going to ask about that. What is the status of that work, and when do you anticipate it will be completed? Um, so that, that's been run from, through the um, Prime Minister and Cabinet, so I don't have the, the details, but I did talk to my colleagues yesterday, and so uh, at the moment she, she is forming her, her team. The last time she did it, and it was a, an excellent um, uh, piece of work, which has really guided a lot of, lot of the work since then in terms of quarantine. Um, uh, so she's got her team together, and I, my understanding is that, that that work will be starting very soon. Mm. Can I just mm. quickly touch? Yeah, thank you. Can I touch on the the, the first Halton review? Uh, she specifically, in her review of hotel quarantine, she specifically mentioned transport. She thought it was a uh, vulnerable and part of the hotel quarantine system, uh, and she particularly mentioned it. Uh, I'm. What I don't quite understand is um, why a number of the recommendations of the Halton report haven't been implemented, but particularly around transport. Do you have any visibility as to or understanding as to why we've got transport workers, as we did in Bondi, unvaccinated, as we did in Barala in the January cluster, um, uh, was linked to a transport worker. We've never really found out the source of the Avalon cluster, which had 150 cases in, in New South Wales over Christmas, uh, but um, it was suspected to be linked to transport uh, or hotel quarantine of international crew. Uh, have you had any uh, advice to government about in, or any urge, you know, urging any um, uh, improvement or requirements around that aspect of the quarantine system, the transport workers. Um, absolutely, and it's it's uh, it's been part of the all of the of the work we've done through AHPPC to see how much what improvement we can do there in terms of safety. One of the key elements there was to absolutely, and this was at, at the behest of of the premiers, in fact, to make sure that from the very first tranche of the Pfizer vaccine that came in February that a, a specific portion of that would go to vaccinate the quarantine system from transport through the hotels um, and anyone that was associated with that. So it is very disappointing that that limousine driver had not been included in that, in, in that rollout. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is back in September when Ms Halton delivered her report. She's got, uh, page 23 of her report actually has a description of what does good look like. She talks about transfers. She says best practice also recognizes risk and that travelers may be COVID-19 possible, positive, and the same principles extend to the transit passengers. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, this is September. We are now here in July. We, I mean, New South Wales completely locked down. It's incredibly frustrating that we're in this circumstance. Um, the state premiers have repeatedly said it's because they do not have enough supply and they, there hasn't been, the, the rollout has been, and I have to say, while I take on board your advice that people should get vaccinated, as someone who's tried to get vaccinated here in New South Wales, I have to agree with Brad Hazard, it is like the Hunger Games trying to get booking. Uh, so my frustration here is trying to understand why the Commonwealth hasn't moved faster to implement that aspect of the Halton report. Senator, I might just intervene here. New South Wales Health has acknowledged that this was a failure of the public health oversight. That limousine driver had plenty of access to vaccine. There was never a suggestion from New South Wales Health that there was a vaccine supply issue. That was a failure of their protocols. They had protocols that these people should be vaccinated, <clears throat> that they should be daily tested. And this particular uh, contractor failed to adhere to that. They have ensured now that those failures have been addressed. It was a human failure, nothing to do with availability. Do you know that for certain? Do you know that for certain? Because the police have declined to press any charges. Uh, sorry, you go. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, I, I do know for certain that there, there was, a, there was a, a complex contractual arrangement with that particular driver, uh, which meant that they were several steps away from what had absolutely been guaranteed to us and had been guaranteed 
uh, within New the New South Wales complex system of quarantine, um, that everyone had been vaccinated, that everyone was adhering to masks and other personal protective equipment uh, elements, and were being daily tested. That's the other element that we, we brought in after the Halton review. Um, so that, mm. unfortunately, none of those things were happening with that particular driver. Now, the, uh, pressing charges and so forth, obviously that's a, an element for the New South Wales Police, but, um, uh, but I, I believe that that three times removed contracting element was probably uh, part of the issue. It, it is possible yeah. that he did not know about those, those matters me needing to be done. Senator Keneally, we've mm. got five minutes till um, sure, Professor and I, Kelly and I'm Professor Hewan. Sorry, Professor. General Professor Fruin. Fruin. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's the way it goes, I'm told. <laughs> um, yeah. If we could. Yeah, thank you. And I'm aware that I'm aware that Senator Watt um, also may want to ask a question here before this block of time um, wraps up. Um, if I can ask, um, uh, you you said there a moment ago, uh, I think it was you, Professor Kelly, uh, that if you reduce the number of people, you reduce the um, the risk of of the virus coming into the country. I just know there's been a lot of public outcry in the last few days over things like over celebrities coming into the country. Katie Hopkins has been a, a, a notable case. She, of course, has been sent home. Um, there's speculation that Thomas Markle, the, the, the brother of Meghan Markle, has been allowed to come into the country. Apparently, uh, Caitlyn Jenner is currently in quarantine all for um, television show purposes. Channel 7 says that these um, they're not taking up spots available to um, stranded Australians or part of the international rival caps that they are additional and they have been granted, quote, granted an exemption by the government. Um, have you given any advice to uh, the government in relation to reducing the number of celebrities that are allowed to come into Australia? So, um, Senator Keneally, I, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that it's the, the Australian Border Force Commissioner who makes those exemptions um, and not me. So I, I don't have any... Um, that I don't have an opinion one way or the other, or, or any powers to influence it. Oh come, come on! But you would have you would have a view. You've just said if you reduce your advice to the prime minister on reducing the caps on international arrivals was that if you reduce the number of people coming into the country, you reduce the risk of the virus coming out. But we now know that there are groups of people who get to come into the country above the caps, and they are given exemptions by the government. And I'm just wondering if there has been any advice to the Prime Minister about seeking to reduce uh, the number of people who fit into this special privileged category of getting to come into Australia. There have been many discussions uh, about about the categories themselves, um, but as I said, that's not under under my power. I, I'd stand by my advice that the less people that are coming from high-risk countries into Australia would decrease the number uh -huh. of positives and that would decrease the risk. How that how that how that's calculated as to who comes that's not my decision. Okay, we might take that up then with Border Force. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator Keneally. Look, I'm going to have to let Professor Kelly and General Fruin uh, go. They've got other matters to attend to. Um, General Fruin, just one final question yeah. from me as you pack up your belongings: mm -hmm. um, Is there a plan, an operational plan for home care? For home, you know, age to home care, that you've been you're putting in place. Uh, no, I'm focused uh, on the aged care workers specifically at this time, Senator. In residential aged care, because yeah. there's aged care workers going into home care. Yeah. But so there's no plan at the moment. Not not a specific plan for that. I've got a specific plan to uh, work on the aged care residential aged care workers who are now yeah. subject to mandatory vaccination requirements by mid September. Do you do you know if you'll are you going to put one in place or...? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll look to uh, what requirements there are, Senator. OK. So you haven't, it hasn't been part of your, your work to date? Not a focused effort at the but moment. those workers yeah. are freely able to access vaccines at all of the potential sorts, okay. sites of vaccination and at the moment, and they're being encouraged to so do. Senator Tina the Coordinator General of the Task Force. Uh, one of the things too we're looking at is we can't actually necessarily identify everybody, so we're looking at matching the Australian Immunisation Register data first of all, because one of the things is while um, uh, <coughs> Professor, sorry, um, Professor Murphy said they have access to all channels and we continue to encourage them, we actually have to be able to track them as well okay. to determine. Um, Ms Blewett, are you staying? 
Yes. Oh, OK. That, yeah. And you work with um, General Pruin. I do. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, because he did take on notice the doses that for Senator Patrick. Oh, yeah. The actual dose yes. arrival answer. I'm not sure if that's available. I'll see if I can track that down. OK, that would be good if we could do that by the end of the hearing. Yep. Uh, Senator Watt, I'll go to you and then I'll do a, a, a final round the ground. Thanks, Chair. I, I have a couple more about quarantine, but just on the home care workers, um, Dr Murphy, how many how many home care packages or recipients are there in Australia? It must be in the tens of thousands at least. It is, Senator. I'm not. I don't have that data, exact current data, with me. But there are a large number of people on home care packages. Yes, Senator. But but the vaccination of workers providing services in the home to at least tens of thousands of older Australians is not currently a focus. It is, it is a focus. It is a focus, Senator, well, because General Bruin just said that there's no plan. At there's no point. plan to proactively ramp up as there is in at the age in the residential aged care workers, but the home care workers are included in the phase one priority, and they have access to every single point of vaccine presence, whatever their age, and they are encouraged to seek out those vaccinations at their GPs, at the state clinics. Um, at, at the uh, pop-up clinics that we're setting up for aged care workers. So they are given plenty of access and encouragement to, to get vaccination. Once but, that's, but that's been the approach all along, Dr Murphy, is that people have had access, and so far it's seen less than 30 per cent of aged care workers overall vaccinated. I mean, that, that approach just hasn't worked. Well, it is working now, Senator. We're seeing significant rise in the vaccination rates of aged care workers generally, but, but, but most specifically we are focusing now on the residential aged care worker group because that is the highest risk. But that's not to say that home care workers are not a, a, a very significant priority. And once we've completed the inreach to aged care workers, if there is still an issue with home care workers, we will develop uh, specific uh, strategies to enhance that. Um, just back to quarantine, um, the government obviously uh, sent, a, sent a, I think, like a two-page letter to the Queensland government a few weeks ago proposing a site at Pinkin Bar near Brisbane Airport. Um, I take it there is now a joint assessment underway between the state and federal governments about that site? Uh, that's correct, Senator. I would refer you to uh, the Department of Finance is, is leading on that, but, but uh, uh, Mr McCormick, uh, Mr McBride can, is involved in that process and can provide more information, but there is a joint assessment underway led by okay. the Department of Finance. Thank you. Just in the interest of time, I might just put a couple of um, particular questions. Uh, what is the Department of Health's role in assessing the suitability of this site? Our, our role the whole way through has been to provide the design, uh, be, have be strong input into the design guidelines for any such facility and the infection control requirements for such a facility. And uh, the Chief Nursing Officer, Professor Alison McMillan, has been heavily involved in the design guidelines, uh, initially for Victorian facilities, but they will be generalised to other facilities. So Mr McBride might add further. Uh, no, nothing to add, sorry. What, and what, what, again, I realise this might involve other departments, but what sort of assessment was undertaken prior of the suitability of this site was undertaken prior to it being suggested by the Prime Minister? I think we'd have to refer to the Department of Finance on that, Senator, because they, they, they were the department that identified that as a potential site. OK. And just dealing with health matters, I mean, I would have thought that I can see some benefits in having a site near or right next to an international airport, but there'd certainly have to be some health and safety issues, one would think, about a site adjoining an international airport, whether it be about aircraft noise or air quality or even, you know, where planes land in relation to accommodation, how close it is. Is your department involved in assessing any of those issues? We're providing health advice as, as requested by the Department of Finance, but they are leading on those assessments. Mm. Paul McBride. So from a, health point, health, from a health point of view, has the department raised any concerns about um, <coughs> health issues that might arise from this particular site? So Paul McBride, <coughs> Secretary <coughs> Strategy, Evidence and Research. So 
we meet regularly with the Department of Finance as part of this process. So all the things that you mentioned are being considered by them as part of the assessment process. So some with more influence from us than others. And um, Professor Mercy mentioned the work that uh, Professor McMillan is undertaking, but all those things are being considered. So oh and noise, all those sort of things will be part of the consideration, but finance is leading that. Okay, so what concerns do, does the department have from a health point of view about that particular site? So our health assessment process is to make sure it operates effectively as a quarantine facility. So that's the sure. work that Professor McMillan is undertaking. What, what can, I'm asking, have you raised any concerns from a health point of view with the Department of Finance? So they have pretty strict assessment processes that build those into them. So they're, they're looking at air quality, they're looking at um, soil quality, they're looking at noise quality, they're doing all the normal things that you would go through in building a facility. Now that facility will have a specific purpose, obviously. Um, so I know, our, our additionality I haven't, I haven't is really that... Got... Sorry, you go. I've asked, three or four, I've asked three or four times now whether the department has raised any concerns. I understand there's a process underway. What I'd like to know is whether your department has raised any concerns from a health point of view about that site. No, Senator. You haven't? Okay, thank you. Um, just in terms of lockdowns very briefly, obviously this year's federal budget included a range of assumptions on the frequency and length of lockdowns that was informed by advice from the Department of Health. Has the department provided any updated advice to Treasury or other departments on the likelihood or frequency, length or severity of lockdowns? Uh, not recently, Senator, but as I think the, uh, the Prime Minister has indicated, there is a significant uh, body of work being undertaken by the Doherty Institute modelling with the Delta strain what is likely uh, to happen, um, including impact of vaccination. So that, that, that will be advice that uh, all governments will look at uh, when it's completed in, in coming weeks. But there hasn't been any specific advice uh, to update. Uh, other, other than the advice on the current, si the medical advice on the current situations in New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia, which have guided uh, government decisions in relation to financial support. Is that uh, sorry, it would be sorry, Senator? Assume, what, can I just jump in on that Doherty stuff? Is that going to be released in full? Is the, that the, the intention? intention? The intention is that it will be released uh, in full. Uh, the full. That, work. That, that is that is my understanding. Okay. Obviously, a decision for government and. And National Cabinet will be involved in that process, but uh, my understanding is the Prime Minister's intention is to release the information. Okay. Sorry, Senator Watt. And we've only okay. got five minutes left, so I might just have to do a quick check around. So if you could just sure. finish up. Um, so, leaving aside the work the Doherty Institute is doing at the moment, has the Department, or to your knowledge, ATAGI, ever modelled um, the vaccination rate that would be required to avoid lockdowns. Obviously, we're now in a different world and the Doherty Institute is doing new work, but is that something that the Department of Otagi has ever looked at previously? Well, the, the Department has, Doherty had, did do some preliminary work in relation to the earlier strains, but that now that Delta is the dominant strain, that is the current work that's being undertaken because that's the relevant work to the situation in this country at the moment. So. There is no relevant pre-existing modelling that would inform decisions about vaccination rates, but it's very clear that the Doherty modelling now is aimed to determine uh, those vaccination rates both globally and for particularly vulnerable groups that might be required to enable the next steps in the transition in our, in our response in the coming out. So what did the department previously advise government was required in terms of vaccination rates to so, avoid so, lockdown? So the previous advice uh, to government was that the highest priority uh, was to vaccinate those vulnerable t for severe disease. And that was the initial target. Um, and that was uh, to be achieved by uh, around this time. And we're very much on the, on the, on the path to achieving that. Then the next piece of advice was to um, offer every Australian vaccination by the end of this year, which seemed feasible. And then, uh, depending on the epidemiology evolving, modelling would be done 
to determine the, the, the ideal vaccination rate. And that's the modelling that's being done now, and that it has to be done relevant to the strain that is circulating. So we don't have that information at the moment, Senator. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, I'm just, I haven't got anyone on the WhatsApp saying they want um, further questions, so I'll just if yeah, I know Senator I, I know Senator Seawitt would absolutely be up there. Um, okay. Senator Seawitt, you have the last five minutes. And I oh, sorry, can you, um, Miss Blewett was there. She oh she's obviously chasing that other answer, is she for me? Okay, thank you. I'll just follow that up. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, can I ask, is there any consideration being given to uh, reducing the movement of workers, disability workers uh, in congregate care the same way that there's been consideration done around residential care and workers moving between facilities? Is the same thing now being considered for uh, disabled people in congregate care? Uh, Senator David Mulhall, First Assistant Secretary, Disability Rollout. Um, I, I understand your question, B. Has there been any consideration to reducing the mobility of the disability workers? Um, uh, uh, no is um, the answer to that question. I'm willing to look at it. Our efforts have been very much focused on vaccination rates, uh, and certainly for disability workers, uh, we're at 50.9 per cent at first dose. Um, yeah, I've got, on that. I've got that information. Yeah. Yeah. How many, how many people, disabled people in congregate care, have had their first and second doses? Yes, Senator, I can give you that information. So, for NDIS participants in disability accommodation, uh, we have uh, 22,285 we're talking of. In 4,900. What, what percentage is that? So Sorry, we've had 53.8% uh, at first dose and 27.1% fully vaccinated, two doses. Thank you. Could you take on notice which states, can you provide a state breakdown for those figures? I'm able to do that, Senator, yes. Okay, thank you. And do you have the figures for disabled people nodding across the disabled population? in terms of not not specifically uh, I have I can partly answer that question we are working on the broader definition of the disability cohort so all NDIS participants uh, which includes 1b by definition we're looking in the order of 254,000 people currently we have 33 percent at least one dose and 14.7 percent both doses, but as you appreciate, that's NDIS participants, and the sector is much broader than that. Uh, and we're trying yeah, to enumerate that. You foresaw my next question. Yeah, yeah. So no, we so continue to put definition you, around that. So you're just working on a definition, so you you don't actually know what proportion of disabled Australians have received. First or second dose? So for the purposes of the task force, we're working on hard data sets. So for the information I've given you, for example, the NDIS participants disability accommodation, we know who they are to some de high degree of confidence. We've now matched that against the Australian Immunisation Register. So with authority, I can give you that information. When we talk about NDIS... So could I... Yes. So I just wanted to clarify. So the information you gave me about congregate care, is that more broadly, or is it for those in congregate care with a pack with an NDIS package? So they're in congregate care with an NDIS package. Yes, they are recognised NDIS participants. There is a broader. There's okay. A... So is it is it therefore? Am I correct in my understanding then that people in care who don't have an NDIS package, you don't have a, you don't know. You don't know how many have been vaccinated? No, that's not quite uh, the case. So, um, and I'll lay out, I'm very happy to lay out on notice to you, you know, what we're working on. But in broad terms, yep. we have NDIS participants in disability accommodation. We have NDIS participants in residential aged care, and all of those sites have been visited. Uh, we then have a, a small group, around about four and a half thousand, um, 
who are funded in schemes by the states and territories. Uh, and uh, you know, so we're working to uh, give hard data against that. We know the number, but matching that against the immunisation register or other data sources we're working through now to be able to give hard data on that. We've then got the broader participants within the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the 254,000 I spoke of, but then more broadly than that again, you know, is those who are covered by workers' compensation uh, and other schemes who, depending on definition, may be disabled or might not be. I'm trying to get a better understanding of that. Okay, um, Senator Seward, it's 1.45. I think you will have to put... Can I put one on notice? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, in terms oh. then of... Sorry, oh, like right now. <laughs> I've got a lot to put on Real notice. Real time on notice. Now. Okay, make it snappy. Yes. So in terms of the notice that we have been given, um, we have notified the Minister of Health that the Minister of Health has mentioned the number of people that are uh, on other schemes. There's a number of people, uh, disabled Australians, who don't have that source of funding. Or they don't have a fund, have funding. How are you identifying them and getting an idea of the picture of those vulnerable Australians who have access? Yeah. Okay. You can take that on notice, Mr Mulhall. Um, Ms Blewett, yes, <laughs> thank you for chasing that down for yeah, me. For fine. Senator Patrick, actually. Yeah, um, thanks, Chair. So in relation to the question earlier about the recent delivery of our Pfizer this week, so yeah. we received a million doses. Yeah. That's been received in three um, uh, points. So there was 800K in Sydney, so that's about where it's yeah. landed. Um, 1,000K in Perth and 1,000K in um, 100, Melbourne. 100,000, 100, sorry. Yeah. Um, K in both Melbourne and Sydney. And then that's obviously distributed across the different channels according I think to that General Freeman's plan. Did he ask for the two weeks or perhaps? Oh, just, I did, Chair. I, yeah, I thought Oh, did you ask for two weeks? Yeah. Okay. I think I'll it was for two. Get the, the previous week as well. Okay, so we'll get that. I think it was a similar number, but I'll get Okay, that, if you could. Yeah. Oh, Senator Patrick, you exist in the <laughs> ether. Didn't you know you were still watching. there? All right. Thank you. We will get that on notice for you, Senator Patrick. Um, can I thank very much uh, everyone's time today? I acknowledge it's exceptionally busy for you, so we do appreciate it. And that concludes today's hearing. Um, please provide answers to questions taken on notice by the 6th of August, and the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.